So we're at um, we're at six thirty, and it looks like we have quorum. So I believe we'll uh, we'll get started. So um, to start, bienvenue tout le monde à cette audience publique sur sur en ligne pour le comité de régulation pour la ville d'Ottawa. Welcome everyone to this uh, online hearing by the Committee of Adjustment for the City of Ottawa. The uh, Committee of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial tribunal appointed by City Council to make decisions on certain types of applications under the Planning Act. The ones that are most common are the applications for consent and applications for minor variances, but there are other types of applications that the committee does consider, and we will in fact be uh, hearing uh, a, a permission application this evening. So my name is Anne Tremblay, and I will be chairing the hearing uh, this evening. With me are my fellow panel members, Mr. Scott Hindle, Mr. Colin White, and Ms. Kathleen Wills. Also with us tonight is uh, our Deputy Secretary Treasurer, Mr. Matthew Garnett, and we also have a coordinator uh, this evening with us with the committee, who is Ms. Mandy Nguyen. So Mandy is going to be helping us uh, throughout the evening with, uh, with presentation materials and keeping me on track. So please note that this uh, is a video conference. It is being live streamed on YouTube. You can access the video if you'd like. It'll be archived along with the agenda on the city's website. Uh, so anytime you'd like to look back, you can. Um, before I begin, there's a number of items that we need to outline for your information. To begin with, while there's a lot of matters that surround development um, in the city, the mandate of this committee is actually quite limited, which means that there are a number of things that we cannot consider one of which is any aspects of the proposal which isn't part of the application that's before us. So we really can only address those items uh, that are specifically outlined within the context of, that, of the applications before us. We also can't um, address any noise, pollution, property maintenance, or property values issues, nor prosecution for illegal construction. This committee has to deal with these applications as if no construction has begun. Also, we will not entertain personal comments about neighbors, uh, agents, or applicants, so please uh, refrain from doing that. Also, any additional variances that we might find through the, um, through the course of discussion, uh, and this can occur, and in, in particular, uh, something that does occur is where maybe greater relief from a minor variance may be required. If that's the case, in all those cases, the applications have to be adjourned and the applications have to be recirculated for, pro for proper public notification. Uh, okay, so that, uh, that essentially concludes all of the items of information. Also statutory public um, notification requirements uh, are part of the Planning Act. The applicants are required to post a sign on the property and file a statutory declaration confirming the sign posting. The declaration must be on uh, file with us today, or uh, we can do um, an oath or solemn declaration uh, before we can move on with the application. Um, and at this point, my understanding is that we have received two um, statutory declarations. So for the remainder of the applications, we will be doing oaths or solemn declarations. So. With respect to quorum, we had a bit of a storm today, so looks like it's it's windy out there, but if we happen to have technological issues where we lose quorum, what we tend to do is uh, we try to wait because uh, as we've all found reconnecting, it the internet does, does in fact um, allow us to do that. Sometimes the absences are very brief. And in those cases, we'll be patient, we'll wait for the members to come back and we will simply proceed from that point on. If, however, for whatever reason, we lose quorum because the, uh, the technical difficulties encountered are insurmountable and we really do need to, uh, to uh, postpone the hearing of the rest of the applications. In those cases, what we'll do is we'll step them to the next meeting of the Committee of Adjustment and continue from that point on. Uh, in terms of the hearing process, there is a list, an agenda with a list of items that um, was on the screen earlier, certainly are posted on the city's website, so you, you can always access those there. 
for the sake of efficiency, the committee can um, essentially vary the order in which we're going to hear applications. And uh, we will, again, be doing that this evening. The committee members do have a chance to review the materials um, which relate to each one of the files, the application files, in depth before we get to this point. And, um, but we, of course, make no decisions until the applicant, agent, and anyone who has an interest in the application has a chance to come forward and uh, address the, um, the committee. We, uh, we normally start with a, so now we have, in fact, two different approaches. We try to fast track some applications. And in other cases, we will, in fact, hear a presentation. So we'll start in those cases with a presentation by the agent. Uh, and then what the committee typically does is, uh, if there's any questions to clarify any part of the application or the presentation, then it's the uh, committee's um, opportunity to do that. So there's a bit of a dialogue with the agent applicant and uh, with uh, committee staff and planning staff at, uh, at that particular point. Once all of that is done, we will open it up to the public portion of the hearing where we will hear from anyone who has registered to speak and we will start with those. And from that point on, um, I'll ask if anyone wants anyone else who's observing and attending this hearing wants to speak. And at that point, we will allow you to come forward and to, uh, to have your say. Um, once we've completed all of that portion, the public portion will essentially close the meeting, uh, the public portion of the meeting, and then the committee gets a chance to deliberate. Sometimes there's additional uh, questions to staff in order to ensure that we have all of the information that we need to make uh, our decision. Uh, if you are a, uh, well, it, the agents, most of you, we have all of your information, so we don't need you to really uh, introduce yourself. For those who have, uh, in fact, put their names in, uh, and we have a speakers list, we do have your name for the record. We also have the, um, your municipal address, which is great. For anyone who has not um, already provided that information, if you do want to address the panel, I'm going to ask you to start with your name and your, your municipal address, and then we can go on and hear your comments and uh, answer any questions that you may have. Once the, uh, once the committee's finished deliberating, it's time to make a decision. So the committee can essentially either make an oral, grant an oral, um, or, sorry, can grant the application orally or refuse the application. The committee can also reserve on its decision. So if there's, a, if it's a case where we've had a lot of new information brought to us through evidence um, from the public, in those cases, sometimes what we like to do is essentially uh, close that, um, the hearing on that file, but uh, then stay back after the entire hearing, the meeting of the committee is adjourned. And then we go through the new information to make sure that, um, that, we, uh, that we've considered everything, all the new information that, um, that we've heard. Once those decisions are made, a formal written decision is issued within 10 days of the hearing, and all decisions of the committee are subject to a 20-day appeal period during which time the decision can be appealed to the local planning appeal tribunal for a fee. So that said, I need to ask the committee members whether you have a conflict of interest with either any of the items that are on our agenda this evening or on the agenda of either panel that uh, sat earlier today. New declarations, I see no declarations of conflict of interest, so that's great. I did see that we do not have any minutes to, uh, to adopt at this particular point in time. So we're gonna go next to uh, adjournment requests. We have two. The first is on application number four for 320 Marshall Court. This adjournment request comes from, uh, from a member of the public. So I'm gonna ask whether or not there's a Mr. Glenn Boyd or Heather Potter uh, available to speak to that. Heather Potter, I see your hand is raised, so please come forward. Ms. Potter, we're going to ask you to provide 
uh, information uh, with regards to your request for adjournment on this application. Okay, I'm not sure if Ms. Potter- okay, can you hear us? Take your video off of the chair. Can you hear us now? All right, so yeah, I can hear you. Yes, and I, we can see you. Great, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Just, just briefly, uh, I said, my name's Glenn Boyd, as the committee knows, and, and thank you for, uh, for hearing our application for an adjournment. Um, my wife and I, we own the property, which is on lot 29 or plot 29, which is right adjacent to the property. And our concerns is, and the reason we like an adjournment is it's come to our attention that um, at least one of our trees is gonna be affected by the proposed um, plan. And we haven't had an opportunity. We only received really word of this two weeks ago and we haven't had, we had an opportunity to sort of review the history of this. I understand there's an extensive history to this lot um, a whole severance background. And then we also haven't had any chance to speak with any council or decide how we'd like to proceed. We've had an opportunity to speak with our community association, but that's the, it's the extent of it. And not in our voice. And the other thing that we're concerned that we do have, which to our knowledge isn't addressed in any of the materials, is whether there's been an arborist report, uh, report that's been prepared uh, with respect to the impact that this could have on the tree on our property or the trees that are going to be affected by the proposed development. And so what we'd like is simply time so that we can make the proper consultations that we need to make so we can come before the committee uh, and make representations based on fact rather than, or at least evidence that you can obviously weigh and uh, determine accordingly, but so we can make a much more informed submission uh, uh, to the panel. Right. So Mr. Now, Boyd, I've, yeah. I've got a quick question for you. When did you receive the notice of a hearing? It was about two weeks ago. I guess so. About two weeks. It was in our it was in our mailbox, actually in an unmarked envelope. Yes, our, our, the, the, no, the, the notice okay. consisted of an unmarked envelope stuck in our mailbox. That, that's the notice we received. We received one from the city and then we received a bit more from the proponent in this envelope. Okay, and what's, what steps did you take at that point to, uh, to gather more information about the application? At that point, we then, uh, I reached actually out to uh, Mr. Cloutier, our, uh, our um, I guess, uh, uh, representative, city representative, we reached out to their office. I spoke with my neighbors, we reached out to the community association. Uh, the community association uh, helped us, so we had a Zoom meeting with them, I provided a lot of background information. Uh, uh, but up at, and and then uh, after the community association, we again talked with the neighbors, tried to determine what the best way forward was, and realized that in order to, due to the, the pressing time, in order to make any further steps forward, we're going to need an adjournment to properly address this. I, I had no idea of the history. One of the uh, neighbors is aware of the history, and the community association was aware of the history, so they provided that information to us. Uh, but we haven't had any opportunity, given the very short tight line, to actually properly prepare a response before the committee. All right. Any questions for Mr. Boyd or Ms. Potter from the committee members? All right. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this request for adjournment? Um, Christine McQuaig. Agent Ms. for McQuaig, the... Ms. McQuaig, Ms. McQuaig, sorry. Can we come back to you in a moment? Because I see that Mr. Lindbergh has got his. So I was. I, I just wanted to hear from everyone before I went to to the uh, to the agent. Um, so Mr. Lindbergh, did you want to speak to this adjournment request? I see that you're on video. So just uh, and you're on mute. So I'm not hearing you. <laughs> I'll I'll unmute now. Yes, I'd like to speak briefly to this. It's an adjournment to the adjournment, right, Mr. Yeah. Lindbergh? Okay. Yeah. I'm. Um, um, Chair of the Planning Alta Vista Community Association. The community associations play a number of roles. And in this case, uh, we're playing the role of honest broker. We've, uh, we know a lot about the history of this corner of Marshall Court. This is the third time this particular piece of land has come before the Committee of Adjustment since 1993. Um, you've already heard from Mr. Boyd that he, he 
feels he needs more time to understand things. In, in our judgment, um, asking for an adjournment for a couple of weeks to allow that to happen uh, makes eminent sense since the matters are, are looking at the history, especially in the appeal to the OMB are fairly complex. And uh, so the Altavista Community Association uh, requested adjournment for two weeks and we have offered to facilitate a discussion between the applicants and the rest of the neighbors or if, if that's helpful to them or they can dialogue directly with each other but um, it seems to us that a, a couple of weeks time uh, might solve a number of the problems. Mr. Lindbergh, when you got notice of this application, did you take steps to organize a meeting with the agent at all at that point? I, I did not try to meet with the agents. I, um, in fact, um, uh, I only discovered in the, the only listing on the application, of course, is the owners, and I, that, that doesn't list contact information. I eventually emailed um, to the um, agent um, on Friday uh, our request for adjournment when I discovered her email in the corner of one of the documents uh, uh, attached with the submission. So I have not dialogued with the, I've had a brief email exchange with the agent. Um, uh, I have not dialogued with the owners. All right, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Lindbergh from members of the panel? All right, I see Ms. Fish that you're also on video. Did you want to address the committee on the question of adjournment for this application? Hi, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm supporting everything that has been spoken so far from Gary and from Heather and Glenn. So um, just, I don't want to waste time by reiter reiterating what they've already said. However, I want to voice that I support what they've said as a, um, I'm at 329 Cunningham. So my 3, 320 Marshall, uh, will back onto my property. So we're within the 60 meters and I've um, sent a submission to the committee as well for adjournment. All right, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Fish from the members? No? All right, Ms. McQuaig, you're, oh, Mr. Hindle, did you want to? Sorry, I was just gonna say, like, I think in this case, the you're requesting um, an adjournment, but in this case, it's to deal with trees is that is that my understanding because i think in this case we're not necessarily dealing with the construction footprint of the house that we're just dealing with lot area and then the the rear yard which in this case wouldn't necessarily address trees like that would be able to still be figured out in the future if i'm if i'm correct well if i can address that, i mean lot area is part and parcel with the reason there's a lot area issue is because of the size of the house. The reason there's, a, there's an issue with the uh, size of the house is because of the impact it's going to have on the trees. Uh, so it all sort of flows into one. Uh, if the house was smaller, there wouldn't be an issue with lot size <laughs> or backyard size. So All right, so Mr. Mr. Potter, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, unfortunately interrupt you because the, the lot is a lot of record at this point. So they need, in order to get a minor variance, they need to have uh, a very, or to get a building permit, they need a minor variance for that lot area. And because of the configuration of the lot, it affects the rear yard in the way that, uh, that those things are determined under the zoning bylaw. So it's, we're not dealing with the, with the house, the size of the house in this case. There's in fact no minor variance before us that deals with any element that has to do with the size of the house. So, um, all right, that said, I think, and I, Mr. Hindle, I, I support to the, the direction that you were going in on this, <laughs> but I would very much like to hear from um, Ms. McQuaig because I think that uh, we will get, to, I'd like to hear from her, whether or not she heard from some of the, the um, speakers that we've, uh, we've heard from already uh, as within, the, within the, the notification period. So Ms. McQuaig, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as I said, my name is Christine McQuaig. I'm the agent for the owners who are uh, Jelu Takala and Christina Takala. And I do want to um, specify, and it is in my presentation, um, that the owners did reach out to all of the immediate neighbors um, starting back in August. 
And I believe uh, the most, the last communication I think was only as late as September 10th. So that's, you know, roughly a month or so. Basically all communication with the budding neighbors occurred prior to the sign being posted on the site itself. And with regards to the trees, because we are aware of that issue, I have read the OMB document. Um, a tree conservation report was actually appended onto the site plan that was submitted to the Committee of Adjustment, which did specify that uh, the, tr the trees near the neighbors aren't, aren't being touched and any trees that do need to be removed are going through the appropriate city processes to do so. Um, and new trees are going to be planted. But to your point, the, the size of the house we're not seeking any setbacks that would affect the size of the house. Um, the rear yard setback is actually exceeded and just because of the reverse pie shape, that's why we need the variance to the rear yard area. Um, and it's about one square meter in reduction. So it's really not anything of significance, but all other setbacks are met. And I think the combo of the interior side yard setbacks are even exceeded by about 0.5. All right, so Ms. McQuick, I, I'm going to stop you there because I don't want to get into the merits of the application at all at this Correct. point. I just wanted to, I wanted to get a sense of the extent to which there had been pre-consultation with the neighborhood. And um, it sounds like, so I, I guess my question to you is, can you tell me, did you, did you speak specifically with Mr. Boyd or Ms. Potter, or Mr. Lindbergh or Ms. Fish um, prior to the notice uh, being, being circulated? Just tell me a little bit about that. So I have some sense of just how much engagement there was previous. So um, there, I believe my client spoke with directly all of the immediate neighbors, both. So on either side, there's two rear neighbors that about their lot. And then also, I believe, two or three of the neighbors directly across the street. Um, the owner, Jalu Takala, is also available on the Zoom meeting. If he, I was not part of these meetings, I, I, I allowed the client to meet their future neighbors and, and have those discussions with them and let them know about the project. So um, he can confirm who he met with when, but I, in my presentation, I do list the dates that he spoke with them and the addresses associated with those neighbors. All right, okay. Committee and they raised sort of, sorry. No, please finish. I was gonna just gonna say? say they ranged like the, two last weeks of August to the first week of September from my memory. Can I just interject here? It's oh, no, actually, no, no. Now I'm going to go to the committee members and I'm going to give them a chance to ask McQuaid some questions. So, um, and does anybody want uh, any further clar clarification about that, um, that uh, pre-consultation and outreach? Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Wright. Uh, just uh, perhaps we could get some input from the, uh, some confirmation from staff with respect to the uh, formal circulation that was carried out, the timing, et cetera. And, and that would be in addition to the comments that we've heard from Ms. McQuaid with respect to the efforts that were taken by the, uh, by the proponent. Uh, if we could just get clarification on the notice and timing uh, from staff. All right, so Mr. Garnett, can you, uh, can you please, uh, I, don't fit, I think Mr. Garnett, you're, you're best placed to be able to provide us with that information. Can you tell me what date the notice went out uh, I, at this point? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. The notice would have been sent in the mail September 21st. September 21st. Requirements. Okay, and, and we're still mailing out the, um, the notices through Canada Post? That's correct. Okay, and any the complaints? the requirement for the posting of the sign would have occurred on the same day. All right, and any complaints to, to your knowledge about uh, for any other applications with regards to a notice actually getting to people in a timely manner? I'm not aware of any complaints. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, so as a result of that, I um, I think what we'll do is in committee, I'd, I'd like to see either your yeas or nays on this, but I think I'd like to hear the application. We'll get some of the background about the uh, about the hearing, previous OMB hearings and uh, and the discussions that occurred. But I would uh, I would suggest that this, at this point, it sounds like we should uh, be proceeding with the application. Anybody not in agreement? Okay, so you all agree. <laughs> I think I might have asked that in a way that, that gave me the, the wrong answer. But um, okay, so we are going to, uh, to step this down to on the agenda and we will hear it, but we're gonna hear from the, um, from the more fast-tracked 
uh, applications before we come back to this. So, um, so the the uh, adjournment request is uh, is declined. All right. Thank you. Just to be clear. All right. The second adjournment request is for application number thirteen for one fifty nine McCurdy Drive. Uh, I think I'd like to hear from. I know this is a, a staff requested uh, adjournment, but can I hear from the applicant, please? Who would be? I'm looking for, let me just see who I'm looking for. I'm looking for Mr. Petticombe. Mr. Petticombe, are you, are you there? Madam Chair, I don't see Mr. Petticombe. If perhaps they could raise their hand, it would assist us in bringing them into the meeting. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Petticombe, can you raise your hand? Is there any agent that's here to speak to, uh, to 159 McCurdy? Madam Chair, it's possible that the, the applicant isn't represented um, due to the request being sine die. Um, I understand from consultation with the, the other deputy secretary treasurer that they may have already moved ahead with a circulation of a amended notice for this application. Well, so I, I'm, I was actually kind of not inclined to sine die this one. And I was actually going to see whether or not we could fast track the, um, this application. So, uh, so with that then, Mr. Garnett, do you, do you think that the application might be ready to be heard at our next meeting on the 21st? Yes, I believe so, Madam Chair. I, by my understanding, again, from speaking with uh, the other staff members is that it was um, moved ahead in order to be able to meet that October 21st timeline. All right, does anyone on the panel have any objections to, um, to adjourning this application then officially to October 21st? No, is there anyone um, in the audience? Is there anyone in the audience who and I don't see anybody with their hands raised? But anybody who in the public who would like to speak to this uh, request for adjournment? Okay, I see no one. So for the record, oh, Mr. Handel. Yeah, the only thing I'll note, Madam Chair, is just um, maybe for staff when we come back on this item. Uh, I note that the rear yard setback numbers between. The application and the staff report don't match. So I just want to make sure that when they come back that it, it's updated. All right, thanks. Good catch. Thank you. Something like that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, so for the record, October 21st, we're going to hear 159 McCurdy. Okay, thanks. That's great. So we're going to move on to our fast tracked uh, applications at this point. Um, and I think I'd like to go with um, number two, which is uh, 49 Promenade Avenue. And I think I'm looking for, who am I looking for here? Uh, Mr. Balsera. Hello. We have Mr. Balsera to speak to the application for 49 Promenade Avenue. Mr. Balsera. Good yes. evening. Hello. Um, all right. So we uh, we're going to. Um, I'm, I need a couple of things from you first, uh, and one is an oath or solemn declaration, which means that I have to find that paperwork. All right, because we don't have on record um, your um, declaration, uh, statutory declaration about the signposting. So I'm going to read something to you, and then I'm going to need you to respond. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted first at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and that the sign was clearly visible and legible for the entirety of that time? Do you swear that or affirm that to be true? I swear. All right, thank you very much. And with that, then, we are not asking for a presentation from you. I guess at this point, I don't see any housekeeping requirements on the file. So committee, do you have any questions for Mr. Balsera? On this application, nothing at all. 
All right. Well, in that case, I am going to open it up to anyone in the public. I don't have any speakers for this application at all. So is there anyone in the public that would like to, um, to speak to this application either for or against? All right, for the record, I'm, I'm truly not seeing anyone. So that said then committee members, we're granting the application. Please all, uh, all in favor. Thank you very much to Mr. Balsera. Your application is granted. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. The next application that I would like to hear, many would like to hear, are applications six and seven for 47 and 49 argue. And I'm looking for, in this case, uh, Mr. Budzik. Hey, Mr. Budzik. Good evening, Madam Chair. How are you? Good evening, Mr. Budzik. All right. So again, we're not looking for a presentation. We've uh, we've had a chance to go through the the file, um, pretty pretty much in detail, and you and your very fulsome report. Thank you for that. So we need to um, I need to ask the committee members whether or not they have any questions for you on this Sorry. application. Sorry, Madam Chair, Soren Oath, please. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. On this one. All right, so Mr. Baldzik, I'm gonna read something to you and I need you to respond. So do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted first at the property to which the application applies, secondly, for the prescribed number of days prior to the hearing and that the sign was clearly visible and legible for the entirety of that time. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that to be true? I do. I beg your pardon? I do. No, you need to you need to tell me that you swear or that you I, I swear that the signs have been posted for the necessary time, <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Excellent. Back to back to your application then. Your applications, because you've got uh, consent and a minor variance um, as part of the I just want to be sure before I go too far that I've also made any housekeeping. Okay, so I don't see any housekeeping changes required to your application. All right, committee, it's up to you. Any questions for clarification from Mr. Budzik on this app, on these two applications? All right, I'm not seeing- Madam Chair? Uh, yes, just, Mr. White. Just a question uh, concerning, uh, there's a, uh, inspection with the, on Google Maps, you know, Google Earth, and uh, on site, there's a uh, hydro pole which is located uh, in the middle of the, I think, the middle of the proposed new lot, uh, which will have to be relocated. I would suggest that we should insist that that relocation uh, be committed to uh, prior to the issuance of the consent uh, certificate. All right, just, um, and, and thank you for reminding me, Mr. White. So Mr. Bunzik, the committee had a chance to look at a number of elements about the application, and it seemed to us that there may be a condition of approval that's missing. So we had, uh, we thought we would request um, that if required, that the uh, owner applicant at, you know, demonstrate to the satisfaction of Hydro Ottawa that the, um, the services, the hydro services have been appropriately relocated. And it's in reference to the hydro pole that Mr. Uh, Mr. White had alluded to. It's not part of the conditions right now, but we, we had thought we would uh, maybe include that. And I see Mr. Mr. Hodgins that uh, you're there. Also would like your thoughts on this. Um, maybe, you know, in our, and in, in I guess our, our review of the application, it seemed that something was missing, but maybe maybe there's a reason for it. So actually, I think I'd like to hear from you first, Mr. Hodgins, on that, if you could, please. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, staff did not pick up on the hydro pole location. Um, I think typically we would reserve that for hydro unless there was significant concern about the developability of the parcel post-severance. Um, in this case, I think staff would likely defer to the applicant on, on how they would proceed, recognizing that if they go for a building permit, it is possible they may need to relocate the hydro pole at that time. All right. 
Um, Mr. Madam Chair. Oh yes, Mr. Wright. Go yeah, ahead. I would prefer that uh, the arrangement uh, be made a condition of our consent authority. I, I don't agree with uh, the potential to pass this on to the uh, a subsequent property owner. I think it should be dealt with and addressed at the time of the uh, issuance of the certificate of consent. So I would I would strongly suggest that we should include a resolution of that. Uh, uh, hydro pole relocation, hydro service uh, relocations as a condition of our, our approval. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Wright. Receiving clarification, obviously, from hydro that that's been, that's been done. Thank you, Mr. Wright. I, I would agree with your comments. So, Mr. Budzik, I think the committee is uh, inclined to add that um, eighth condition regarding making sure that there's a clearance letter from Hydro Ottawa to ensure that their requirements and the services have been appropriately dealt with prior to uh, to getting the certificate for um, for um, consent. So, all right, and, it, and your thoughts on that? Yeah, if I may, Madam Chair, I believe there was actually a revised staff report that was issued this morning and condition eight is related to um, the airport authority's comments, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I did have a brief conversation with Mr. Hodgins this morning, and so this would form the ninth condition. Ah, okay. I did. I did not see that in my <laughs> in my comments. I certainly don't have anything beyond seven. So, uh, Mr. Hodgins, did you want to provide some clarity on that, please? Uh, that is correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, staff submitted a revised report, simply adding an eighth condition. Um, unfortunately, it was missed at the time of original commenting, and it is for a noise study in relation to airport noise. Um, it was caught as a result of the airport authority's comments and we're just looking to impose that condition to meet that requirement of the official plan. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, yeah, not sure why, why, maybe I'm the only one who missed it, but, um, but Mr. Budzik, then this would be, and you're quite correct, condition number nine in that case. And, and thank you. And, and just to speak to that briefly, uh, we are aware of the hydro pole, uh, obviously outside of what would be the, the center of the three properties. Um, we understand that there is a minimum distance of separation to uh, the driveway or to any other uh, constructed elements that may be part of the future development of these lands. Um, while we'd be generally agreeable to the condition, um, we are relatively confident that there may be an option where the hydro pole will not need to be relocated. So if that is the case, is that condition simply satisfied if it can be demonstrated through the building permit process that there are no issues? Well, so Mr. Budzik, all we're really asking for is a clearance letter from, from Hydro Ottawa. So if all of that happens, all they need to do is to clear the condition is to write into committee staff and say, we have, you know, we've been in discussions with the owner developer and we are satisfied that, you know, either they say these things happened or we're satisfied that nothing has to happen. And as long, I think what we're saying is as long as there is that, that in some way there's, there's the demonstration of having dealt with that issue, the hydro services themselves, that's all we're really asking for. So we're not asking you to do anything more than that. Um, so I, I, I'd be inclined to, uh, to agree with Mr. White that it's just, it would be nice to have that, have a, a certainty that that's dealt with before there's actually the, um, the, the sale of the lot. So, so I think, um, all right. Are, if, are you amenable then? Or would, yeah, so we're no agreeable to get into that condition. Yes, we reviewed all of Hydra's comments and, and that's kind of aligned with what they've said. Uh, so we agree with that as a condition of the consent. All right, thank you for providing that confirmation. Okay, any other questions to the applicant in any way before I open it up to any public presentations or comments? All right. So I see then that we also have uh, with us, Mr. Is it Constantine? Uh, yes, it is. All right, so Mr. Constantine, um, we're gonna give you a, a chance to provide your comments. Uh, Madam Chairman, thank you for uh, the chance to speak. Uh, I'm new to this process and I'm impressed with the way you manage this agenda. I think this is, uh, this is new for me. Um, we, our, our interest is pretty simple. We're immediately next door to the proposed uh, developed property. We live at 45 Argue Drive. Uh, our lot is uh, 30, uh, I'm sorry, is uh, 30 meters wide. And so the proposed property adjacent to us essentially becomes 
in the character of the block kind of a half width lot. And we uh, invested here in 2016, uh, building a new house, thinking that the zoning specs for the R1 uh, FF that we're in would continue to have the minimum widths respected at the front, uh, which creates kind of a look and a feel in this neighborhood that has, has widely spaced homes on larger lots. And uh, when we invested here, uh, it's a substantial investment. We were under the impression that that zoning spec would be protected and that that felt relevant to our, uh, our real estate investment. Um, my concern is, is, yes, I see this as an exception. Uh, I look at the proposed min, uh, lot size of 16.3 meters and I compare it you know, to the minimum in this zoning, which is 19.5. And I, I just kind of scratch my head and I say, well, the minimum's almost basically 20% larger than the proposed uh, lot size. And it's, uh, and I start to just ask, you know, at what point is it minor? I don't know that I understand that, but I, I, I would feel remiss in not kind of bringing this up as, a, as what I think is potentially uh, an exception and a precedent in our neighborhood that could change the sort of look and feel of the spacing of the street. Uh, so I, I uh, you know, I'm not losing sleep over this. I'm not angry about it, but I, I would feel wrong not asking that sort of a hard question of, you know, the size feeling almost like a half lot in in uh, a neighborhood where, where uh, a lot of people, including ourselves, have invested uh, heavily in part because of the lot size. Great. Thank you for your comments. Any uh, one from the panel have any questions for Mr. Constantine? All right, okay. Um, I guess just from my standpoint, so Mr. Constantine, you said you were at 45, are you? Okay, yes. all right. Because I'm, I'm looking at Four Seasons Drive behind you and all of those lots are literally half the, um, the size of the lots that are um, on sort of the south side of yes. our drive. So, you know, it's not like you don't have a, a bit of a, a smaller lot fabric uh, nearby, for sure. So, um, yeah, but I do you know, see that very, very different zoning. That, you know, that that is a, uh, you know, an R2F zoning on that Four Seasons. And part of our decision, you know, to invest was based on the idea that we were not investing, you know, in the, the R2M four seasons, uh, lot sizes. All right, okay. Okay, any other questions or from anybody else? I just wanna make sure before I call somebody else. Okay, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to come forward and uh, provide some comments or ask questions about the application, whether you're for or against? Uh, Mr. White? Um, Madam Chair, I just, uh, just a, a comment. Uh, I, uh, my first, when I first looked at this uh, this application, uh, I did note note the uh, uh, ra rather significant reduction in, in uh, the lot width that is proposed here. However, I, I think in terms of offsetting considerations, this is an extremely deep. Uh, deep both lots are extremely deep. There's substantial lot area. It's highly, highly uh, different. It's significantly different from. In terms of lot area, to, from most lots in the in the immediate area, and uh, in my view, that would that would that would uh, go somewhat to justify the reduction in, in lot frontage uh, being compensated for by a very substantial lot area that significantly exceeds the zoning requirements. All right, thanks for those comments, Mr. Wright. All right, I don't see anyone else who wants to come forward. There are no further questions for either the applicant or, um, or Mr. Constantine. So I'm gonna ask for a vote at this point. Um, those that would be uh, in favor of the application. All right, okay. So Mr. Bonzuk, I think the, um, I think it's unanimous for the committee. We are going to grant uh, both the consent and the minor variance. And I think, um, I think Mr. White recapped very well, like the reasons why the committee would be, um, would be in support. The lots are noticeably larger. I'm looking at the square, square meterage of the properties and, uh, and certainly that, that would be an, a bit of an offsetting type of, um, of uh, condition or circumstance. So, uh, with that, Mr. Baldrick, you have nine 
conditions of approval? Any one of those that you would like to raise or are you comfortable with all of them? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I've gone through the conditions with my client and uh, we are comfortable with the conditions as included in the report. All right, well, in that case, uh, good luck with, uh, with the project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next application then that we will address is number eight, which is um, five, 25, 555 Recot, and I believe we're looking for Ms. Libman. Ms. Ms. Libman, I see her there, so we'll give you a minute. Good evening. Hi. Hi. I see that you have your, your declaration for signposting in, so that's good. I don't have to remember to do that with you. Yes. Um, so Ms. Lidman, typically when we, we get to the fast tracks, we don't ask for presentations, but in this case, we want a brief presentation from you just to explain all of the moving parts to your applications, just to be okay. sure that we, we did understand what we thought we understood. And then if there's any questions, we'll go from there. Great, I submitted a, a brief presentation, so I'll just wait for that to come up. Okay, so maybe if we can go to the slide just before that. Here we go. So here we see, oh, <laughs> back to, there we go. Uh, so there are five low rise residential uh, apartment buildings proposed and uh, we're seeking to sever two from three. It's uh, largely for financing purposes. It's a condition of CMHC. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So that shows us the subject site um, as part of sort of the larger context. You can see the 174 at the top. It says Ottawa Regional. That's the 174. Um, and so there are existing townhomes on Eric Chapnick Way uh, that you can see there when you're driving down the 174. And so the proposed uh, low-rise apartments will be behind those closer to St. Joseph Boulevard. And if you go to the next slide. It shows a super complicated set of plans, uh, which with what I hope is a simple uh, overlay, which shows the area of where you see block five that shows where the three will be. And then on the other side of the yellow line is where the two apartment buildings will be. And then the next slide actually is more illustrative. So here uh, in the red circle is phase one, which shows the, those three low, low rise apartment buildings. And then in the green circle, phase two. Uh, so the site plan control approval has been granted. All of the zoning and parking requirements are met. Uh, there were no comments uh, received from Hydro Ottawa, Rideau Valley Conservation Area, City or Rogers. And there was one comment received from the public, uh, which was not terribly relevant. It had a question about servicing of their own development. Are there any particular questions you have? I, I, I guess if we could go back to the, the actual survey plan, the, the, the one that's got all, the, all of the parts on it, I think that's just what I, I so it was helpful to see your 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 phase one and your phase two because now I can look at that survey plan and and uh, and just make sure that I understand following along on your application to be sure that 
that's in fact what we understood. So if we can go back to that one. I guess that's the previous one. I need to go back to the, the slide before that one. All right, so it's we're in fact looking at the yellow line. All right, now I'm seeing it. The yellow line is in fact what's differentiating between your phase one and your phase two. And the descriptions that you've provided essentially reflect where that line in the sand is being drawn, right? That's right. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Ms. Libman on this? We're all clear? We, we, we know and understand all the parts because I, I think I was trying to look at the location plan and figure out how this survey plan fit over the location plan and still figure out what we were doing here. So at least for me, Ms. Lippman, this was helpful. So thank you <laughs> for doing that. Okay, I don't believe I have any speakers registered to, um, to either um, speak for or against the application. So I'm gonna give anyone out there right now the chance to do that. I'm not seeing any hands, but I just want to make sure that we take a moment to uh, give some on the chance, not seeing any hands coming up at all. All right, well, in that case, uh, committee, all those in favor of the application? All right, so Ms. Libman, the application is uh, unanimously granted. So, uh, so thanks for Thank you. being with us here this evening. Thank you. Before I go, I just want to make sure that you have on your agenda under new business uh, the matter uh, regarding 116 lamplighters. Uh, okay, I've got 153 Kennevale. Is that the same? Yes. It, yep. It's the yep. same. That's one. the same. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I think we we've made a decision about that one. We tend to make those decisions uh, in our pre meets, and so we've instructed staff to um, to respond to to your your request. I don't think we need to address it here right now. Okay. Okay. Right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a nice okay. evening. Bye. -bye. You too. Bye now. Bye. <laughs> Okay, um, the next application is number nine, which is 355 Everest. And I believe I'm looking for, the name here is Mr. Sutherland. All right, so I'm seeing Mr. Posen. <laughs> Mr. Posen. Hello. Good evening. Uh, uh, yes, I am the co-signer of the uh, planning rationale before you, although Nick is the official applicant. And we also have Carmine Zayun, who has appeared on your screen, um, who is a representative for the owner of the project. All right. So, Mr. Posen, I need a uh, either an I need a sworn oath or declaration uh, from you for the sign posting. So if I read something to you. Is it you or is it Mr. Zayun? It's it'll be you. it'll be Mr. Sutherland for that one. Yeah, that'll be me. Yeah, maybe Mr. Sutherland. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Lots of people to pick from this evening. That's great on the sign posting. Okay. So, um, Mr. Sutherland, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was uh, posted on, at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing, and lastly, that it was visible and clearly um, legible for the entirety of the time. Do you swear or um, affirm that to be true? I do affirm that to be true. All right, okay, great. Um, with that, let me just make sure there are no changes to your application required from a housekeeping standpoint. I don't see anything come up, okay. So we don't need a presentation from you. Uh, so I'm going to open it up to the committee members for any questions at this point on this application. All right. Mr. White, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, uh, I wonder if I could get some clarification on the uh, minor variance A aspect. Uh, I, I, I understand the simple one uh, B 
with respect to uh, building setback, but I'm a little bit cloudy on on what the uh, minor variance A uh, says, what that refers to. I wonder if we could, right, just, so uh, there might be a graphic that could show what we're talking about there. Yes, and, and in fact, Mr. White, then in that case, we actually have applications number nine and 10 before us this evening okay. that are for, and gentlemen, one of you correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like essentially the same property. So, um, and for one, we're looking at two variances and for the second, number 10, we're looking at uh, variance C. So maybe just quickly give us uh, what that is. So for this variance, um, it's basically the result of a zoning interpretation that requires Saint Laurent Boulevard to be the front property line. So because of the AM zone, it requires, um, uh, basically it requires that that be the front property line for the zoning interpretations. So the zoning bylaw also has a provision that requires 50% of the building to be located within 4.5 meters of that front lot line. Now, because we're well over 140 meters away from Saint Laurent Boulevard, technically, as we're in the mid block of this property, it's physically not possible to be within 4.5 meters of that property line. So essentially it's because of this interpretation that we're requesting that variance. Does that make sense? Oh, Mr. White, I'm looking for you. Are you uh, satisfied with that response? I believe you're on mute. Yes, Mr. White, you need you need to unmute. Sorry. Uh, so the intent of the bylaw, if this was a simple situation with respect to the street, the proximity to the street, is to the intent of the bylaw is to push the building as close as possible to that street. And in this case, you're not able to do that because of the, I guess, the separation from Saint Laurent Boulevard. Is that, in a nutshell, that's what we're talking about? Correct. Yeah. So essentially, because we're so far away from Saint Laurent Boulevard, we cannot actually meet that provision. But um, we do front onto a private road, Everest Private, okay. and we do have, uh, we are within that 4.5 meters along Everest Private, right? So it essentially replicates the conditions and maintains the intent of the bylaw. Okay, I hear you. Thank you very much. All right. So, Mr. Sutherland, why don't you just give us a quick overview then on variance B and variance C, since you're at it? <laughs> sure. So, thank you. Variance B is basically uh, within uh, the ground floor is supposed to be up to over 50% glaze uh, within uh, the frontage along Saint Laurent Boulevard. However, once again, as we're over 140 meters away from this frontage on Saint Laurent Boulevard it's not possible to physically meet these provisions. Um, so because of that interpretation though, the bylaw still requires that facade to have glazing, um, which we can only provide up to 35%. Um, it is technically the side of the building. And so the intent is not for it to be necessarily glazed to the same degree that a front of a building would have along an arterial main street. Um, so you could see on the site plan that although we don't meet that, um, the glazing along the frontage of Everest Private is still very active. And there are entrances, um, doorways, things like that as well, that essentially uh, maintain that intent of the bylaw there. All right, thank you. And then for, for variant C, we're looking just at a rear yard setback. Indeed, so again, this one is result of the interpretation. So because the front lot line is at Saint Laurent Boulevard, the uh, rear lot line is technically the west property line on the side of the building, um, which would require us to provide a 7.5 meter setback as it is technically a rear yard, though it is functionally a side yard. Um, the other point of that variance is that as we are on a private road, it is not considered a corner side yard. So if that road was to be a public road, this would be a corner side yard with a three meter setback requirement where we're providing 2.97. So once again, generally maintaining that intent of the bylaw, it's a matter of interpretation for the uh, lot lines that's causing this issue. All right, thank you for that. Um, okay, any quest other questions then from the, uh, the members of the committee? Yes, Ms. Willis. I'm not sure whether this is for staff or perhaps to the agent for the applicant, but I, 
I find this a very odd interpretation with the AM zone extending so far back from Saint Laurent Boulevard. And I'm just wondering whether this is something you've encountered before. Um, I think the intent had been for a single lot, it, the AM zone extended to the back of the lot, but it looks like there's lots of different addresses on this property. So is this a really irregular situation or is this a normal interpretation of the, of the AM zone? I'm wondering if somebody can answer that for me. Well, let's uh, hear from Mr. Hodgins then, if we could, please. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I believe this is a fairly um, uncommon occurrence. Uh, my understanding is the M10 provisions were implemented more recently and likely an oversight with regards to how it did, how it affect the zoning on this property. So um, I'm not aware of another situation where this has occurred, but um, I'm, I'm hoping not. And I would say this is um, irregular. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Mr. Sutherland, just remind me, where are you on in the site planning process on this? So the site plan application is almost complete. Uh, we have the delegated authority report and it's currently being reviewed. All right, okay. So Mr. Hodgins, we're, we're pretty sure that we're not uh, looking at any further potential variances than I guess on this application, right? Just looking for some confirmation. Correct, through you, Madam Chair. The planning staff identified they were through four reviews of the application, so fairly far along, and no major changes were expected at this time. All right, okay, perfect. Yes. And sorry, Madam Chair, if I may, there was also a reference in the staff report that uh, spoke to, um, for if the committee saw fit to approve, having some language in there just about uh, um, the potential for um, you know, future minor, minor modifications. I think uh, perhaps Mr. Hodgins can, can refer to that, but that was in there in the staff report. Through you, Madam Chair, that's correct. Just, um, we requested the wording to reflect minor modifications to be made, um, recognizing that, you know, the setbacks would stay the same, whether that may be, you know, change to the building for Cade or, or other things just to, ensure that there's no problems with the site plan control process while ensuring that the variances themselves are um, applicable and the standards are applied here. Yes, and to be clear, we're not expecting that to happen, but it, it does assure us um, going forward just in case anything happens. All right, so are we tying them generally to plans then? Uh, that, is the that is the language that has been used uh, before. If the committee saw fit to do so, um, we would certainly appreciate it. Well, we've been hearing new language. That's why I was kind of <laughs> asking the question because um, <laughs> yeah. there are there are now uh, greater tiers to um, to yeah. the. Uh, so there's so remind me those. Of, I think you were all at the meeting. So there was strict. There's strict. There's generally, and then there was one sort of in between, and I can't recall <laughs> what that was. So <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to figure out whether or not we should be going one step higher than whatever that, uh, whatever that, um, Mr. Mr. Garnett, can you, do you remember what that, what those three tiers were? Madam Chair, thank you. We haven't implemented any um, new language for plans conditions or had that dialogue with Building Code Services Branch, but perhaps uh, through you put it to the applicants. Um, more consistent with what our language has been, would it be sufficient if approval, subject to the committee agreeing, um, was tied to the size and location of the proposed construction being in accordance with the plans filed as it relates to the variance sought? The size and location. Um, I, I, I suppose, I mean, if this is uh, language that the committee is comfortable with, I think uh, like I said, the likelihood is that no changes are going to be made, but just in the event that uh, anything happens, it would certainly allow a little extra flexibility. So if that's language that, that you're using before and, and are comfortable with, um, it's okay with us. Uh, J Jamie, just to point a comment, I was on the call with the engineers today. I think the, the reason we're requesting that is there is some, there could be some engineering kind of difficulties on some with the retaining wall with the adjacent property. So the sizing of the lot may, the, sorry, the underground may shrink. Uh, so I don't know if we can directly, maybe we not increase in sizing, Jamie, but maybe. Uh, All right, let's, you know what? We, we do use generally tied to plans. Um, 
I was raising this because I was just trying to see whether or not, and thank you, Mr. Garnett, I know we haven't implemented anything, but at least it's good to get the discussion started about the possibility of introducing some new tiers. So, um, uh, so if, if the committee is okay with it, we, we would then, depending on how we decide, tie it generally to plans. Are we, are we comfortable enough with that? Okay. All right, so if there's no other questions to Mr. Sunderland, Mr. Zayun, or Mr. Posen, I am going to open it up to the public portion. And I do believe that I have no one for either item number nine or number 10 on my list. That said, is there anyone out in the audience who would like to speak to either application number nine or application number 10? Both of which are, well, I guess number nine is, um, Officially 355 Everest and number 10 is 374 Everest. But is there anyone who wants to speak for or against either one of those applications? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. So committee, I need you to vote on both. So on item number nine, 355 Everest, all those in favor? All right, so that uh, the granting of that application is unanimous for the record. And for item number 10, those in favor? All right, so again, for uh, the purpose, for record purposes, the, um, the application is granted unanimously. All right, I don't believe I see anything else that needs to be discussed to them, gentlemen. So thank, thank you, you for uh, thank participating. You. And um, again, good luck with your project as well. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay, the next application is number 11. Number 11, Mr. Segreto. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Segreto. All right, so again, we've had a chance to look at this application at, and I do need, a, I need to know from you. Okay, let me read this. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted first at the property to which the application applies, secondly for the prescribed number of days uh, prior to the hearing and that the sign was uh, clearly visible and legible for the entirety of that time? Do you swear that to be true or affirm that to be true? I swear. All right, thank you. Okay, so like I said, we're, we're not going to ask you for a presentation on this. I do have a housekeeping matter with you though um, on this application. My understanding is that the legal description needs to be amended for, for notice purposes uh, and that we are in fact uh, introducing the words part of lots 25 registered plan 301, part four plan for our 23529, is that correct? That's correct. All right, thank you very much for, uh, for that. Okay, then uh, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Segreto about this application? Yes, Ms. Willis. I'm just um, looking at the site plan and see that there's an existing asphalt laneway um, going out to Greg Street. And I'm just wondering if that is in any way relating to this application. I, be I believe in uh, 2008, this property was severed and that was a right of way that was provided for this newly created lot. Therefore, they have the right to go over that asphalt there in order to um, get to the uh, parking lot in the back, parking spaces in the back. So that will remain an access to the three parking spaces at the back of the uh, property? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with questions? So, Mr. Segreto, oh, Mr. White. Okay, Sorry, go Madam, ahead. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, this this lot was severed some years ago. Uh, am I correct in that? What was the in two thousand and eight? Two thousand and eight. Yes. So essentially, the committee of adjustment at that time gave approval to this lot size. Madam Chair, you uh, gave approval to the lot size and lot area, correct? Uh, and the only reason you're here is to uh, because in order to get a building permit on that existing lot of record. Uh, the reason I'm saying that I have some personal difficulty with the variances in terms of the lot creation originally, but that's that's ancient history. Um, 
Am I correct in, in my interpretation of the reason we're dealing with this? You're asking Mr. me the question? Yes, uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Well, maybe staff, uh, maybe staff can just comment on it. I believe this is yours. Hi, um, through you, Madam Chair, yes, the Committee of Adjustment approved uh, the creation of lot in 2008 and provided a minor variance for a duplex. Subsequent to that, a uh, minor variance was provided for a duplex with a secondary dwelling in the basement. Um, so three units were essentially approved and the owner is seeking a minor variance to permit a three unit dwelling um, right now. So it's, it's as a result of the change in the nature of the, uh, the building that we're, we're dealing with this. Thank you. All right, so I, so uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Willis, please, maybe your question will help make it become a little less confused than I am now. Well, it, was just, it was just really, I think I've, I've had, I think it's answered now. At the time it was to be a duplex and, the, and I was just looking at the lot widths for that. So I think of the same concern that Mr. White has that um, with a triplex requiring an 18 meter frontage that it, it's going down to 12.89. Um, had it been a duplex, it would have been less, a semi nine meters each side, um, a townhouse six meters. So I think what's different here is that it's going for a, um, a triplex form, uh, which is a fair, fair, fair difference in terms of um, um, what the variance would be. And um, I, yeah, I guess that's really, I'm a little bit concerned. I don't see in the report the, am I missing something, but I don't see the any rationale for the variance or talk about lot fabric on the street with regard to triplexes and that form of use. And I'm wondering whether or not there's any information that's been provided. All right, so I think there are a lot of questions at the end of the day. So Mr. Mr. Segreto, you have a presentation ready to go? Maybe we can get well, some answers for your presentation. Well, for sure. Uh, if you look at it uh, on this particular block uh, in the report that the um, planning staff has done in the uh, R3A zone now, um, you can clearly see that there are singles there, there are duplexes there, there are triplexes there. The footprint of the building that we have in front of you here today is identical to what was approved back in 2008. And, footprint, uh, the footprint though, right? The footprint, the footprint for the footprint, duplex. Yeah, yeah, the footprint for the duplex. The only, the differences that we have in front of you here today is yes, due to the fact that the zoning has changed from, uh, from uh, the R2 zone to the R3 zone, where we need the 18 meter lot width. And now uh, back then it was 15 meters. Uh, but when you look at the fabric of the street and with respect to the, um, respect to the report which planning has uh, has indicated that uh, this fits in very well with the uh, the streetscape with the fabric and it is very desirable and really there's no difference from what we had back then which was actually three units to three units today all we're really trying to do is justify the lot width and the lot area um, because of the new r3 zone that's in place all right, so Mr. Segreto, just out of curiosity, I'm looking at the, um, the location plan. Which other properties on that street are triplexes? If you can just put it on the board there, you'll clearly see um, uh, there's another map that we have uh, that was submitted, um, the land use map. If you look at the land use map, you can clearly see at the north side on Cray, right to the north uh, eastward, there are two uh, triplexes there. And I believe I have photographs of those triplexes that I've submitted as well. Uh, well okay, so that's like what I'd like to see. I'd actually like to see, um, I know, and yeah, I know you do this well, Mr. Mr. Segreto. I just, I just need to see that lot fabric and I need well, to understand the surroundings yeah. and, and the type of uh, dwelling unit that's well, there. If, if you can go back to the, uh, to the documents that we gave you, there are actually at uh, 2445 and 2443 uh, Clover, there's two triplexes that have just been recently built there in the last couple of years. There should be some photographs of that that I've given you in my package there. So 2445, I'm sorry, what was the other address that you gave me, Mr. Segreta? 
2443 and 2445 Clover. If you look at those, you can clearly see that those were two triplexes that were built, I would say a couple of years or so ago. And there's photographs that I've indicated on my uh, application. Okay, so, be. so unfortunately in this location plan, it looks like 2443 and 2445 only have one unit that spans the two properties. So it doesn't give us any kind of clear idea no, but look at the photographs. There has to be photographs that I've, I've submitted. I, I don't have them before me, unfortunately, Mr. Mr. Segretto. I can't possibly have that kind of package of information before me. That's why no. I'm asking you if it's in your presentation so that we can bring it up on your presentation and we can have a look at it. Can the coordinator put it up there? Because the package was there. The photographs are there. I'm, I'm just uh, working on bringing them up. Uh, the coordinator that was looking after it has uh, lost power. So just give me one moment, please. All right, thank you. This used to happen in the council chambers anyway, though, you know, that we'd have problems with the projector. So <laughs> I don't see this as being much different than being in person. So, all right. What are we looking at? We're looking at uh, 244058. No, that's, that's the that's, subject property. Yes. There you go, right there. That's like a stone throw away from where we're building. It's across the street. Oh, my goodness. Given, given the fact that, that are, those lots are slightly bigger, but that's what was approved uh, two or three years ago that was built at, uh, as you can clearly see, 2443 and 2445 Clover. So Mr. Segreto, on 2443, can you tell me, do you know what the lot frontage and lot uh, area is for that I one? I think they're, uh, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure they're slightly bigger. I don't know how big they are, but they are slightly bigger than what we're uh, proposing, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. And when you say the previous application for duplex was actually three units, what do you mean by the third unit? Well, the, the, the approval was for a, a duplex and then uh, we actually, they actually asked for a secondary unit in the basement, which was approved. So it's technically it becomes a three unit. And what has happened over the years in this particular neighborhood in the Heron Park area, I've done many units in there where there were existing duplexes where we've converted the third unit in the basement into a legal unit when we used to call them converted dwelling units, which is very typical of this neighborhood. All right, so is that what's happening here in this triplex? We're gonna uh, use the basement uh, as the as, as the, the third, third unit apartment? Okay, that's correct. So, and can you tell me whether or not, cause I was looking at your parking layout and you know, for mm -hmm. me, if, if you can't get parking on in a way that works, truly works, um, that's a bit of a, a litmus test for me in terms of overbuilding. So. Can you, um, can you, or coordinator, if it's possible, can we bring up that? And we've seen it a couple of times already. There was a, a slide where it shows uh, the uh, the turning um, configurations in and out of that of those parking spaces. And Mr. Segreta, while we're waiting, did the um, so when when you did the duplex with the secondary unit, did, did you have the three parking spots proposed in the back as well at that point? I, I believe there were three parking spots back then. I believe uh, if you look at the survey that was provided, they indicated three spots back then in 2008. Behind the duplex? That's correct. And was it the same configuration? Can you confirm that? Um, it was very similar. It was behind, uh, behind uh, the building. And that's why we had the right of way off of Craig. Okay, so to, to, um, to Ms. Williams, it, that's not quite the one I'm looking for. There was one that actually shows some vehicle movements. And we saw, like I said, we saw it a couple of minutes ago. We had it on screen. And it's the revised site plan. That's the revised site plan? Okay. Let's see if we can see that then. Ah, there we go. All right, so Mr. Segreto, you used um, the standard engineering um, turning radius um, tools in order to be able to demonstrate uh, yes, the ability to, uh, to, to pull in and pull out of, out of those uh, 
of those parking spaces. And, and you did that for all of them. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this one. How about the one that's closest to the rear yard line? Lot line? Well, I think that one there, I think that one there, uh, I guess one could always just back out uh, like they do in the Glebe area. When you're looking at these houses that have uh, in the Glebe area, uh, you know, eight, 10 foot wide uh, uh, driveways, but um, the one closest the, to, the, to the back line, you know, I think the best is just to sort of back out on that one there. All right, so, so in other words, it doesn't, doesn't really work. Um, so is there a requirement for three parking spaces, Mr. Sugrata? I believe there isn't. I believe there's only two. Um, uh, my client would like the three if we can't, uh, if it makes it a little bit more different and we can provide a little bit more amenity space. Uh, I, I don't see why we can't just uh, allow for two parking spaces and then we can revise the plan and give you a little bit more amenities space in the back. All right, I'm looking for comments from the rest of the committee. Is it, uh, yes, Ms. Willis? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, that was for the reason for my question about the existing asphalt laneway and whether or not it was continuing to be usable because I think with the two accesses out to public streets, it allays any concerns about the usability of the parking spaces. Um, just looking at Google Earth, it wasn't, or Geo Ottawa wasn't clear whether or not that laneway was actually, it says existing asphalt laneway, whether in fact that's actually usable. And that's really what I was asking confirmation is whether it would be used for accessing those three parking spaces. So am I hearing that you're satisfied that that, that if, added laneway? Yes, will give if, them that is, if that's to be utilized for access to the spaces as well as the one at um, aside, beside the building that I'm fine with it. All right, so do we not have another issue here then if we're starting to use the neighboring property to, uh, to make parking work on this site, the actual subject site? Did I miss something here? That was, that, the answer, that was my previous question was that it's a registered easement in favor of this lot. It was part of the original lot creation. It's, it's already different. on title. It's yeah. already on title is what you're saying. It's Yes. The right of way on title, yes. And it's the right, of, it's, I just want to be really clear about this, Mr. Greta. So that, re, that right of way is registered for the benefit of those, for the, the residents of the property, your subject property. That's correct. That's registered. Okay. All right. Well, if that's the case, then maybe uh, I, I'm just interested then why you didn't show us a turning radius that utilizes that right of way if you have it. I tried my best, but I think the I think the better solution here is is you know maybe eliminate one parking space and create a little bit more room for greenery and uh, or I, I'm always uh, a fan of that you know me Mr. Segreto I'm a fan I of added, adding you know green space especially for if you're talking about you know a three units and uh, and 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 you're already in a reduced lot you know, a, a fairly significant reduced lot uh, frontage. So if you're suggesting that, I, I certainly would be in support of it. Uh, anyone else on the committee would be in support of maybe a revised site plan that would eliminate a parking space, maybe that back one, for example? Personally, I don't think it's necessary. I think we've, the revised site plan shows that it works and ultimately it's up for uh, functionally, we'll see, uh, obviously, snow storage, and that becomes an issue over time. But I think functionally, at the very least, that the, the revised site plan shows that it works. So I don't really have any concerns with it as is. All right. Other thoughts? Okay, so just, just to respond to that, Mr. Mr. Hindle, I guess from my standpoint is I, I'm not convinced that, I, that there's evidence to show that it works. So on that then, um, okay, I think we've talked it, we're way beyond where I thought we were doing a fast track. So, <laughs> um, and I see, let's see, I'm just trying to make sure then that, uh, like I said, no one to speak to the application. Um, have I called on anyone who might have an interest uh, in the application yet? I don't have anybody registered as a speaker. Okay. I'm not seeing, uh, not seeing any, anybody come forward. So um, committee, I need to know who's uh, all in favor. All right, so for the record, Mr. Segreto, you've got three members that are in support of your application. I am going to dissent on the application. I don't believe that I was provided 
sufficient information and evidence to demonstrate to me that um, that that this uh, it demonstrates good development of the land. Uh, so uh, so that's my dissent. But as you know, um, the uh, the no, notwithstanding my dissent, the the application is still granted. So. Um, is there anything more we need to discuss in your opinion then, Mr. I don't think so. I don't see anything here that's... Uh... There's no conditions at all on this thing. No, no, I didn't think so. And we don't, yeah. uh, I think we did the housekeeping thing and we're, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Segreto. Hey, thank you. For your information. You. Good evening. Okay. All right. So the next application then is number 12. We're looking at... Uh, 986 Laporte Street, and I am looking for Mr. Ardesanti. Mr. Ardesanti, I think. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mr. Ardesanti, are you there? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. I see. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> I was looking for your name. <laughs> Ardestani. Ardestani. Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you for that. Yes. That's helpful. Yes, yes. All right, so before we can talk too much further, I do need to, to for you to either swear or affirm on your signposting because, in fact, we don't have a declaration um, from you. So do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was, first off, posted uh, on the property to which the application applies, that it was posted for the prescribed um, number of days prior to the hearing and that the post, the sign itself was clearly visible and legible for the entirety of that time. Do you either swear that to be true or affirm that to be true? Yes, I do. Say, I, I need you to say I either swear or I affirm. Which one? I both affirm and swear. <laughs> All right, let's just put you down as you swear that to be true, <laughs> that's fine. Okay. That's good, okay. So we don't need an app, sorry. Is somebody trying to speak to me? Ms. Williams, is that you or is that just background noise? I think it was just an echo, Madam Chair. All right, okay, thanks. I just wanna make sure that, um, that we have everything, okay. I'm just looking to see whether or not we have any housekeeping amendments and I don't see anything here except for uh, in the staff report. So my understanding is we have a revised staff report, Mr. Hodgins, where you have, um, you have added uh, condition number six and seven that um, based on, on those conditions, those added conditions and the revised for our plan, you're satisfied that your original concerns have been addressed? Correct, through you, Madam Chair. There is some corrections to the notice with regards to the revised for our plan, um, addressing most of the concerns. The added conditions um, resolved some of the remaining concerns and um, the one remaining concern regarding the accessory structures, staff are looking to proceed with the condition of relocation or removal. Um, in conformity with the zoning bylaw. So at this time, we're satisfied proceeding um, with those conditions of approval. All right. And if I see this correctly, in fact, the zoning, the, uh, the zoning that's referred to in the notice does need to be amended. I, I see R1W uh, and then special exception zone uh, 767. Is that correct? Correct. All right, everyone. Mr. Ardesanti, you are in, in agreement with the uh, with the modification to the notice to include that exception reference. So, Mr. Ardesanti, you're on mute. Uh, because she muted me. I'm okay now. Uh, yeah, the exception, I, as far as I understand, uh, the, it has to do with the uh, the type of buildings that goes up there and. We are not asking for in any changes or any minor variance about that. Yeah. So Mr. Senator, all I'm, I'm really looking to do here is to amend the notice because when the notice went out, it referred to R1W, but it, it, it omitted having the special exception reference, which is the 767. So all I'm really asking for is uh, your concurrence so we can amend the notice to include that, uh, that exception reference. Uh, 
I really don't understand the question again then, sorry. All right, so when the notice for your application was circulated, it, yes. re it says zoning and then it's, it referred to R1W. What Mr. Yes. Hodgins is proposing is, well, in fact, the zone that applies to your property is R1W, but it also includes a special exception reference 767. So we're proposing to yes. simply amend the notification to include that reference. Why does it need? Because it has, it, it really doesn't affect the application that what we are doing it has nothing to do with the exceptions. It's a technical, it's just a technical matter. It's because the zoning that applies to your property is in fact R1W 767. So all we're saying is we're going to amend the notice to actually reflect, reflect the zoning that applies to your property. Yes. Okay. Sure. All right, let's do that for the oh, record. <laughs> okay, okay. I do not have a very good connection. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, no, that's fine, that's fine. It's good for you to question. It's good for you to question uh, and to, uh, to, raise, uh, to raise comments or questions if you're, if you're not clear on some of this. Mr. Artisani, just, just in terms of staff's um, report though, you have read all of the conditions. You're famili familiar with them all? Yes, yes. We had a very good long meeting with Mr. Artisans and I think we came to a very good resolution about this, uh, Madam Chair. All right. Okay. Enough for me, committee members. Anything that you would like to ask of the applicants for clarification in any way on this on the, on the proposal, Mr. S Mr. Hindle. Yeah. So I just want to get um, maybe I'll, Mr. Hodgins can answer. I, I just want to confirm. So in this case, we're asking that they get a building permit to remove the basically convert the garage back into a garage and that would um, legalize the driveway that's in front of that because it's leading to a garage, is that correct? Through you, Madam Chair, um, pretty much there's, there's two conditions requested. One is for the driveway itself with regards to the size and one is to reinstate that parking space. But the end result we're looking for is to have two parking spaces on the retained parcel, one for each unit and now comply to the zoning requirements. The second condition is just with um, if there appears to be too much asphalt there and it would be worsened by the severance with regards to the percentage of the front yard. So that's just to correct that. Okay. So you're confident that, that with these added um, conditions that your concerns are addressed? Huh? Correct. Um, we're, we're confident going forward that the result severance won't result in further non-compliance with the zoning bylaw. Okay, great. Thank you. So just on, on that um, garage, that living space conversion back to garage, uh, what's the process for just verifying that though? And maybe maybe Mr. Hodgins, you may, may not even be the right person. So um, maybe Mr. Garnett, how, how does one clear that? How do you, how do you uh, ensure that that was done? I guess I'm just trying to... Uh... Thank you, Madam Chair. You're referring to the uh, building permit requirement? For the well so we have a condition and I guess I'm, I'm looking at how do you, how do we deal with the uh, with the clearing of that condition so if they have to we're saying that we need to have demonstrated the conversion of the garage of the living space back to garage how does how does that happen I guess I'm just trying to figure out the mechanics for that I think uh, and perhaps mr. Hodgins could could uh, echo this or confirm this but a building permit will be required and then subsequently inspections. And once okay. they have been satisfied through the inspection process that it's done, they would notify our staff. All right, perfect. I just wanted to understand that a little bit better myself. I had no idea. If yes, I may Mr. Just, yes, yeah, if I may just add in back in 2015, that garage that was a garage converted to a living space by adding a wall behind the garage door. The garage door is still there. And the rest of the room, it's an empty four wall uh, that, that, uh, that really has no, no uh, even the heating part of it is not part of the house. So it's very easy by just taking the wall that behind the, behind the door and converting it back to, a, to be a garage. It will have pretty uh, clean walls for a garage, but I think that the cars will love that. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Fair enough. Okay. Any more questions from the committee before I go to the next phase, which is, um, I don't have anybody on my speakers list, but I'd like to open it up to anyone 
any audience who may be observing who has an interest in this application, um, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak either for or against. All right, I'm not seeing any hands come up. So on that basis then, um, committee members, I guess I'm looking for who's in support. So all in favor? All right. Okay, so Mr. Artisani, the application is, uh, is granted unanimously. So you have a number of conditions to clear. So we're gonna wish you all the best of luck in, in getting through that list. Thank and, you. Uh, it is a long list, but Mr. Harjan is really did his due diligence and he's very, very right on the point there. But we agree, we are, we are right. We're gonna uh, comply with all the conditions, no problem. Excellent, I like how that works out. So Thank good luck. You so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Now, have a nice Bye. evening. Bye. You too. Bye. Ah, okay. Now I'd like to go to. I'd like to go to number Nor Norton. Um, so fourteen and sixteen, uh, which is eight sixty seven, uh, eight sixty nine Norton. And I believe I'm looking in this case. Uh, Mr. West and Mr. Chan. So, <clears throat> Madam Chair, I'm here. I don't see Mr. West quite yet, but he's certainly on standby. All right, so Mr. Mr. Chan, will it be you or Mr. West who is going to uh, speak to this application or present this applications, these two applications? Mr. West will uh, swear the affidavit and present the applications and then I will be available to answer any questions. All right, okay. So we're st I still don't see Mr. West by the way, Mr. Chan, so. I know he's here. I just don't know. I'm just having difficulty bringing them into the meeting. Okay, no way. Yeah, he just sent me a message saying he's stuck on the loading screen, whatever that means. <clears throat> so while we're waiting, then can I uh, impose on you, then, Mr. Chan, perhaps, to do the um, the, the signposting declaration? Sure. All right. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted first on the uh, property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and that the sign was clearly visible and legible for the entirety of that time? Do you either swear or affirm that to be true? I so swear that to be true, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Mr. Chown. How is sir, Mr. West doing? Well, I'm hoping your coordinator is having some luck. Oh, there he is. He's joining us. Okay, great. We're almost there. <clears throat> no worries. Definitely having some issues, eh, with uh, with connecting. Yeah. Not sure if he's. Oh, he might be trying to rejoin. I'll give him another we, minute. Yeah, we didn't have this problem the last time, so hopefully we can figure it out. Now, mind you, I think he's moved since last time he was attended committee. <laughs> Well, uh, I know I know there's a lot of competition for the bandwidth, that's for sure. So no, he's hasn't moved far though.
Well, you heard from Mr. West. Mr. Chow, is he? Uh... Well, if worse comes to worse, I'll wing it, but uh, just give him another minute. Okay. Well, Madam Chair, I don't want everybody to sit here all night while we try to figure this out. So uh, maybe I'll take a stab at it. Oh, he's trying one here. He's, oh, I see a check mark and a mute on his mic. I think we might be there. Hi there, I apologize for that. The storm must be hitting my area pretty bad. All right, well, it's uh, gl glad to see you were able to join us, uh, Mr. West. So we're going to call upon you to, uh, to present both the, um, the consent and the minor variance application. I understand there's a little bit of history here. So if you wouldn't mind just giving us a quick recap of that and, um, and an overview of the, uh, of the two applications, that would be great. Uh, absolutely, do I have to, I wasn't sure if Marie went through it, do I have to swear that the sign was posted? We got Mr. Chan to do that for, <laughs> for Perfect. us, so we're good. Thank you. Um, so good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the applications you hear in this evening are for a minor variance and severance application on the property municipal notice 867 Norton Avenue. Uh, it's shown on the figure in front of you along with many nearby amenities. Uh, it's within the Bay Ward of the City of Ottawa on the east side of Norton Avenue. It's an interior lot with 15.24 meters of frontage on Norton and an area of 464.8 meters squared. Subject property contains an already constructed semi-detached dwelling. And if I'd ask you to switch to slide number two, please. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the existing building is shown on the R plan in front of you and the building permit was issued for the construction of the building on September 25th, 2017. Uh, at this time, building code services did not identify any variances that were required upon review of the plans and review of the zoning bylaws. Um, so I'll speak to the rationale of the severance first. The application will create a lot labeled as part two on the draft reference plan in front of you. Part two will have a total area of 232.4 meters squared, a depth of 30.48 meters and a frontage of 7.62 meters on Norton Avenue. Uh, the severance does not necessitate the construction of new public infrastructure, including roads and services and a plan of subdivision is not required. Uh, the severance is regarded for the criteria outlined in subsection 5124 of the Planning Act, including the supply and conservation of energy and water, provision of, a, provision of uh, communication, transportation and uh, waste systems, minimization of waste, orderly development of safe communities, appropriate location for growth and development, and the promotion, uh, promotion of development that is designed to be sustainable and support public transit. <clears throat> the semi-detached dwelling and the proposed lot to be created are located within a fully developed neighborhood where hard and soft services are available. Uh, it is not considered premature. The semi-detached dwelling and the proposed lot result in intensification of existing lot within general urban area designation of the official plan. Um, Signed attached dwellings are a form of low rise residential development permitted in general urban area and are permitted in the R2G zone, which is part of uh, proposed settlements will result in two lots that fully comply the requirements of the R2G subzone for lot width and lot area for a semi detached dwelling. Um, there are adequate municipal services uh, in uh, for this site. Uh, the semi detached dwelling and proposed lots satisfy all the criteria of, sub of section 5124 of the Planning Act. Uh, I'd also like to say we've read all the conditions requested uh, by municipal staff and are fine with the conditions of, for the severance. Uh, and I invite you now to switch to slide number three, please. Thank you. Um, so upon filing the consent application, uh, we received comments from municipal staff dated August 27th, 2020, uh, which stated a variance would be required prior to severing the existing semi-detached dwelling. Uh, this variance was actually missed by Building Code Services. It was every intention of our client to construct the semi detached dwelling without needing to seek relief from the zoning bylaw. The variance that is required is to permit a reduced total interior side yard setback of 2.58 meters, whereas the zoning bylaw requires a minimum total interior side yard setback of three meters. 
with one, one side yard no less than 1.2 meters. And on the image in front of you, you can see highlighted in the red circles is the 1.29 meters and the 1.29 meters on both sides. Okay. Um, so I'll go through the, the rationale for the minor variance at this time. So the first test for minor variance is, it, is that the general intent and purpose of the official plan is maintained. Uh, the subject property is designated general urban area in the city of Ottawa official plan. The purposes of this designation is to permit the development of a full range and choice of housing types to meet the needs of all ages, incomes, and life circumstances. Further, section 3.6.1 of the OP also outlines that Quote, the city supports infill development and other intensification within the general urban area in a manner that enhances and complements the desirable characteristics and ensures long-term vitality of many existing communities that make up the city. So the existing semi-attached building is a permitted use in the OP that contributes to full range of choice of housing types. Uh, the variance at hand uh, is to prevent a reduced total interior side yard setback. The variant seeks to legalize a performance standard for an already existing house, which is an already existing uh, permitted housing type. Um, this, uh, this dwelling is an example of infill intensification in urban areas that is consistent with the existing character of the community and the neighborhood. So the minor variance maintains the general intent and purpose of the OP. The second task for the variance is it maintains the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw. Um, the purpose of the zoning bylaw, in this case the R2 zone, is to restrict building form to detach and two principal unit buildings, allow a number of other residential uses, provide additional housing choices, permit ancillary uses to principal residential uses to allow residents to work at home, and regulate development in a manner that is compatible with existing land use patterns so that the detached and two principal dwellings, residential character of a neighborhood is maintained or enhanced. Requested minor variance legalizes a performance standard for an existing semi-detached dwelling, uh, which, as I said before, are already a permitted use in the R2 zone in this neighborhood. Uh, the existing semi-detached dwelling meets the for performance standards for lot area, lot width, front yard setback, rear yard setback, and the minimum interior side yard setback, but not the total interior side yard setback. As I said before, it's the intent of our client to develop this property without needing any variances. So the variance in question comes from provision 10A of section 157, which was the uh, infill two bylaws. Uh, it states a minimum total interior side yard of three meters applies. Um, this three meter interior side yard setback was originally written to only apply to detached dwellings. And the purpose of this bylaw is to help reduce any visual impact of a semi-detached uh, building on the streetscape. Um, uh, our client has pursued uh, architectural elements that provide visual breaks from the street and help reduce any perceived uh, impact of massing. Uh, these include the, the step porch with divisions for uh, each semi-detached unit, uh, eaves on the front of the property, a mixture of materials that reduce any visual impact. The intention for the total interior side yard setbacks are satisfied, while the site provides ample space to access the rear yard. A third test for minor variance that the minor variance is considered desirable for the use of the land. Subject property is located within 260 meters from Carling Avenue, which provides ample transit routes. Uh, such bus services as the 57 to 85 bus route. Um, subject property is also located uh, in close proximity to the Lincoln Field Shopping Center, which provides access to plenty of shops and restaurants. Um, Semi-detached dwellings are permitted use in this zone and are present throughout the neighborhood. Uh, Semi-detached dwellings built prior to the infill two bylaws have an interior side yard of 1.2 meters per side, which is consistent with interior side yard setbacks provided on the subject property. Um, we undertook a scan of about a 250 meter radius from the subject property, and we found about seven semi-detached dwellings in the immediate vicinity of the subject property that have a total interior side yard setback of 2.4 meters or less. So semi-detached dwellings with a total interior side yard of under three meters are an established pattern of development in this neighborhood. Request some variance for reduced total interior side yard will fit in with the neighborhood. The fourth test for the minor variance that the variants are actually considered minor in nature. Um, the reduction we are seeking is uh, translates to about 21 centimeters from each side. Uh, the existing semi-detached dwelling was designed to adhere to all the performance standards of R2G zone. And unfortunately, the total interior side yard was missed. Uh, it was designed to provide adequate interior side yard setbacks that are consistent with the neighborhood in the R2G zone. Uh, approval, approval of this variance will result in no impact to the streetscape as the building is already existing and occupied. Uh, so in summary, the, the minor variances are considered minor in nature 
and this uh, application represents good land use planning. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. West. That was uh, uh, that was worth waiting for. I'm glad that um, that we did uh, get uh, your very fulsome uh, fulsome presentation. So terrific. Um, okay, I'm going to open it up right now to the uh, members of the panel. See if you have any questions for clarification. To Mr. West, Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, as I understand uh, the situation, it was. Uh, mistake, uh, an error in interpretation of the zoning bylaw that resulted in the building of the semi-detached dwelling as we as we see it today. Um, and that mistake is the result of the two-tiered, there's a two-tiered uh, side yard requirement. Uh, is that, uh, is that sort of layman's terms? Is that sort of what we're dealing with here? Through the chair, if I may, it's an easy mistake to make uh, for a lay person reading the bylaw. When you, uh, I apologize, we didn't actually provide a slide that shows the table from the zoning bylaw that sets out the performance standards in this zone. But if you look at the table, it's quite clear from the table that the interior side yard setback is 1.2 meters for a semi detached dwelling in this zone you have to dive further into the text of the bylaw to discover the provision that was introduced through infill two, which isn't at all obvious to you when you look at the table, but that, that provision that's buried in the text of the bylaw has this unusual requirement that despite the table, which says the interior side yard setback is 1.2 meters for semi-detached dwellings in this zone, we have to apply the interior side yard set back provisions for a detached dwelling. That's not obvious to anybody reading uh, the bylaw. Uh, and so that resulted in an oversight in building code services. They were interpreting the bylaw based on the chart, as far as I can tell, and didn't note this other provision, which is buried in the text of the bylaw. Our client, we weren't acting for him at the time, but our client simply submitted permit drawings that he believed fully conformed to the zoning bylaw. Building Code Services issued a building permit, and here we are. Um, thank you, Mr. Chown. Uh, Madam Chair, I wonder if I could ask staff if there's been any action taken uh, to clarify the bylaw to make it uh, more easily interpreted uh, this, this special provision. Has there been any changes in that have been implemented or any any procedural changes that have taken place? Because I think we have seen similar applications uh, uh, with similar circumstances that uh, you know it's rather annoying to have to deal with these kinds of things. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, there are, um, I did follow up with the plans examiners and they are aware of this provision. I also followed up with zoning interpretation staff and legal services. Um, there are some provisions that um, infill is changing. There are some additional provisions and I believe that this um, requirement will be brought as Madam Chair, I, I can confirm what uh, Ms. Ramirez was just trying to say. I think she was breaking up. There is an amendment uh, updating infill one and infill two provisions of the zoning bylaw uh, that went to planning committee on uh, September the 24th and will be uh, considered by council on October the 14th. And amongst many, many, many other things, uh, I believe it's correcting this situation. And uh, I believe that once we get into the submissions from some of the representatives from Queensway Terrace North Community Association. I'll be talking a little bit more about those amendments uh, that will be coming into effect as of next week. All right, thank you, Mr. Town. In fact, um, the committee of the whole met with planning staff uh, just last week and we got presentations from planning staff so that we better understand what those, uh, what those changes are and how they intend to apply them and what the intent is. So you're quite right. Um, we're, we're actually looking forward to uh, the clarity that some of these, uh, these changes will, uh, will bring us. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, okay, then 
Mr. Mr. White, I take it you have your answer on that. Does anybody else have any other questions about the application, either the consent or the minor variance application? I think we all have a good idea now how we got where we got to. So, okay, then I'm going to, um, I'm going to open this up to the, uh, to the public portion. I've got two speakers on deck. I've got, um, Ms. Blakeney, I think we'll start with you, Ms. Blakeney. And then Mr. Church, I believe you registered sometime today. So yes. we'll hear from you uh, from there. So Ms. Blakeney, I know I saw you earlier. And she was having technical issues earlier and it appears she's um, offline now. Oh, all right, thank you so much for monitoring did, that for me, that's good. <laughs> she did leave a message though saying, uh, she had requested to speak. She was having internet. Her internet was unstable and she may not be able to speak. She provided input and photos in writing. Basically, I am requesting the committee conditionally approve the severance further to the owner being in conformance with the front yard parking soft landscaping bylaws. All right, thank you. And we, uh, we did get some written submissions from Ms. Blakeney, so that's helpful. So based on that, Mr. Church, then you uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm a relatively new homeowner within QTN, and I appreciate Mr. Murray giving me the background on you know how we sort of arrived in this cart in front of the horse situation where we have a home built and uh, there's people living in it and we're seeking a variance. It's understandable, mistakes do happen. And uh, input has been provided by our association to the planning committee to, uh, we provided input into the, um, uh, recent amendments on bylaws. So we're, we're appreciative of, of being listened to, but we do have a uh, historical pattern of uh, sort of arriving at these meetings with homes already built. Uh, so the impression as homeowners is these well-known, um, so we're having sort of uh, experienced developers who we would assume know these rules, uh, even these subtle subsections that you have to look at. They're coming into our neighborhood, building these homes that have built-in variances they come to us at the last minute and uh, it's really not a matter of uh, engagement. It's really just, they're quickly ticking this off and uh, we don't feel particularly uh, informed or part of the process. And we on more than one occasion have come and had to have to sit through these sessions where we're approving houses already built. Seems a tad disrespectful to the rules, to the intent of zoning infill and the credibility of this whole process. So from our perspective, we'd hope this uh, moving forward will stop or will cease uh, these, um, variances after the fact, which would be great. Um, we'd also submit that uh, if you think about these four tests as a community, um, you know, they really, in the cumulative impact of all these variances we're seeing in our neighborhood anyway, are transforming our neighborhood in, in, a, in a negative way. And in our opinion, they fail to meet the four tests in the aggregate. Um, so if we kind of look at the four tests, uh, you know, a foot or two here and a foot or two there from a developer perspective, even if it was my development, yeah, it's minor. But if we're gonna apply them lot by lot. Uh, we could look at Alpine, for example. Um, one by one, they become in aggregate way more than minor variances. A foot here and a foot here becomes a meter or two. So we look at Alpine Avenue, we see a loss of tree canopy, on-street parking, effective stormwater management, and above all, a loss of our streetscape character. Another great example, having lived in Westboro, was Berkeley Avenue. It's um, that's kind of a poster child of, um, I think, really unfortunate planning and uh, implementation. It's uh, it's a street filled that's with fortresses of houses that are fortresses, crammed and jammed from side to side, front to back. I urge you to have, take a walk down there on the way to Dominion Station, and uh, have a look at that streetscape. So. As a community, we're certainly seeing our share of uh, homeowner turnover and we know infill is inevitable. Um, we feel the projects need to be designed and, and specified to stay in bounds of setback rules and other relevant restrictions. Otherwise, it seems kind of pointless to have these rules, bylaws, and frankly, city staff to manage, or admit, to manage and administer them. Um, from our perspective, sustained minor variances are major in the aggregate and we think they need to stop. Uh, point two or step or uh, point two in your criteria, desirability and necess necessity of building oversized homes on lots that are too small really do lead to drainage issues, less street parking and more snow in the streets, which if you're not familiar with QTN is a real danger to pedestrians, 
who don't have a lot of sidewalks. So when these lots get smaller and there's more driveways, there's more snow in the road. Continuing to approve these projects outside of the rules is not desirable and necessary. There's, we think there's other options that these um, that could be proposed that fit the aims of intensification while delivering on the minimum setbacks and restrictions aimed at making our neighborhoods livable, desirable, and safe. I have to really say, you sort of know you're doing it wrong when the planning committee is using QTN as example of bad infill. So I just ask, ask you to pause and consider that as, as you go about in the future, looking at these as an on a one-off basis, because over time they're adding up to be um, not, a, not really presentable from our perspective. Point three, uh, the general intent and purpose of zoning bylaw is, are not maintained with these continued variances. We think it's about maintaining a baseline, not a sustained one-sided auction of inches and feet to the highest bidder. In aggregate, these um, sustained approvals, uh, we think are somewhat of a shortfall of the responsibilities of committee and the stakeholders, stakeholders that are coming into these sessions when we look at the aggregate versus the individual home and, uh, themselves. Uh, last point I'll make is the, the current official plan requires intensification that enhances the community, not to detract, detract from it. Uh, we've been working with the city to provide and strengthen the rules, and we welcome the stronger rules that are coming, I think, as early as next week. Um, so in summary, uh, we'd ask that you really take a hard look at these variances that are coming in and make sure that they're uh, being requested at the appropriate time. We know mistakes happen, but we'd like to see um, the bare minimum as they are set in the bylaws be set as that. What's, otherwise, what's the point? Um, we'd formally request the apply the bare minimums and really apply critical judgment to a minute set of variance requests before building permits are released. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll cede my time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Church. Um, I'm glad you made a lot of those comments. I mean, we hear you uh, when you say that. I'm, I'm truly hoping that these after the fact um, applications uh, you know, will diminish with more clarity in the zoning bylaw. We've seen that kind of issue, not just here, but we've seen it in other communities as well, where it's there's a lot of layers within the zoning bylaw and unfortunately mistakes, even with seasoned practitioners still happens. Um, and it's it's really not intentional. And, uh, and I, I certainly uh, um, can, um, and sympathize with your comments in that regard. Um, in terms of the accumulative, accumulative impact, that's true, but we really are supposed to be looking at these applications on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, if there is a greater issue in, from an aggregate standpoint, then um, I think what, what you know, the advice that we often give um, community associations is to have that discussion with your area counselor and see whether or not um, there's ways to, uh, to, uh, to address some of those concerns through yeah, either zoning and then like zoning changes in some way. So, so thanks for your comments. Um, do, uh, do any of the committee members have any questions for Mr. Church? All right, thank you. I see we've got Ms. Blakeney, she managed to come back. So uh, well done. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> Did you want to speak, Ms. Blakeney? You have your opportunity. Uh, while I have internet, sure, why not? This is a phone, <laughs> just in case I go offline. Um, so just to dovetail on what Mr. Church mentioned, of course, the neighborhood is seeing um, an influx of new development happening, and it seems to be, I appear to be a broken record because the situation appears to be repeating. So bear with me, developers are coming in, uh, houses get demolished, everything on the land gets demolished. We see the new build come in, developer generally walks away. Uh, the new owner then is responsible usually for the landscaping because that doesn't tend to get done um, before ownership changes and I don't know, they look around, they see what other people have done. And the next thing, we've got a lot of pavement and interlock happening, not a lot of green space and trees being replanted. And um, I guess I'm at my wit's end because I'm wondering who's responsible. You know, they're, they're hiring companies, landscapers, paving companies who come in and say, you want this all paved? Yep, no problem. And then now it's on the residents to to basically follow up. 
And I don't know if you have the photos that I sent uh, to show, you know, you know, we've got a, I've got the, um, the Norton Avenue address and then another Norton Avenue address where there's complete interlock. And I did notify the city last year about it. And I know they sent out a letter because a small little no parking sign went up in the middle of this parking lot that's in front of a house. And then it was removed and nothing has been done. And there's a number of residences, properties um, that, so that's, that's a current, that's Norton, uh, not quite in line with the drawings that were shown by Mr. Taylor, I believe it was. A um, lot more land, uh, hard landscaping there. And then the other photo is the other Norton property where you see it's just complete interlock, lots of parking. Um, not so quite what we're looking for. You know, it's interesting because there's some of these infill some of these changes to the zoning bylaw that are coming forward are specifically to, to ensure that at the time of approval that we are, we are focusing on landscaping and first, right, to, to ensure that we have that greenery on our lots. And, and, and then after that, even, even with these zoning bylaws, as you know, we can approve them, we can see plans that show that. And even in my neighborhood last weekend, I was taking a walk and here was somebody literally interlocking their front lawn. So it's not, I don't know that there's much that the city can do about that. It's certainly out of our hands, as you know, it's uh, we, can, we can approve things the way they're intended to be, to, to remain, but, um, but there's no guarantee and there's certainly nothing we can do, like I said, after, after, that, uh, after that point. So anyway but i do i do hear you i, I know that that's uh, it's unfortunate when that much hardscaping comes in so yeah it sort of goes to your point at a, a different agenda item when you said you asked i guess a committee member how do we know when something is done i think it would have to do with the garage and stuff it's like what's that process and so that's kind of what's happening here is what's the process you know you go to the city they send a letter Usually there's a follow up, but I'm not seeing anything. And, and I can tell you that there was a long, semi long list of properties that I notified the city about. I'm one of those people, yes. And I would say that probably 80, 90% have not done anything. So, you know, this is, this is me coming forward asking the committee to do conditional approval, um, I guess conditional approval of severance pending conformance with the element of what we want the um, streetscape to look at, to look like. Um, and, and just to uh, a couple of points that uh, Mr. West raised, um, Lincoln Fields is being demolished. So that's not one of the amenities that you can put on your list anymore. We've got a, it's a Rexall and a Metro are the only two things that are remaining there. And I do take issue with using other semis and their lot uh, or their interior setbacks as sort of um, standing points uh, for consistency purposes with uh, the, the 867 Norton. Because as my mother used to say, if your best friend jumped off a bridge, would you jump too? So basically, you know, just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it right. Thank you, Mrs. B uh, Ms. Blakeney. Does anyone have any questions for a speaker? All right, okay. Um, um, Chair, I, I just wonder if we could get back to the, uh, the, the, the facts of the application here. We're dealing with a minor variance on side yards. Uh, with respect to approximately one feet, one foot on each side of the equivalent of one feet foot on each side of the unit, um, I think that's the, the important thing that we are we're, we're considering at this point in time. We're not we're not really addressing the uh, the broader questions that really should be dealt with. I think by uh, by council in its uh, thinking with respect to the zoning bylaw. Yeah, that well it's well appreciated that your comments in terms of that i agree uh i guess I, I guess what i'm trying to do to be honest with you is get through the um the, the public comments at this point so just hold that thought 
Uh, is I just want to make sure that I've made the last call. Is there anyone else? So I had Ms. Blakeney and I had Mr. Church on my list, but I haven't made a call out there for anybody else who might have an interest in the application and who would also like to make some comments. And I just wanted to be sure I did that. All right, I'm not seeing anybody, uh, anybody's hands raised at this point. Okay, oh, except for Mr. Hindle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Madam Chair, I think Ms. Blakeney brought up a, a very good point about talking about the, the coverage issue. And I think we've seen the, I think the photos there showed that in this case, the, the site plan that's before us isn't necessarily what's built because we've got a much wider driveway than, than is actually shown on the plans. Um, in this case, because we are doing a severance, we have some conditions that are already imposed um, I wonder if in this case it's worth considering tying the approval to um, removal of driveway except that is in conformity with the, the, the site plan provided and basically tying, tying the approval to the site plan provided for the width of the driveway especially um, dealing especially in this case exactly with that question of um, kind of over landscaping of hard, over hardscaping of that front yard. Absolutely. No, I don't see any reason why not. So I guess it's Mr. Um, no, it's Ms. Ramirez. Ms. Ramirez, mm -hmm. did you want to come forward? Mr. Chan, I'd, I'd like to hear from Ms. Ramirez. And Ms. Ramirez, I that. Um, is there, we, I, I'm just to Mr. Hindle's point, I'm not seeing a condition that um, about that driveway. I know we don't normally necessarily do that, but, uh, but in this case, would you... Uh, What's your thoughts on that? I guess I'm looking for some insight. Um, could the committee coordinator put up the image again of the property? Like the site plan, Ms. Ramirez? Is that what you're looking for? Uh, no, the photo, the photo of the driveway. Because, um, yeah, if, if the committee coordinator can put up the photo of that was submitted by a member of the public, that would give me a better kind of, um, I saw it once, I, I wouldn't mind seeing it again. Very good. Okay. okay. Um, so we, our bylaw speaks to the driveway must be providing access to the permitted parking space. Um, we do permit walkways in the, um, as well. And right now there's no prohibition on um, walkways being next to the driveways. It's not legal to park um, in, um, in the walkway, but we do see it often. Um, the committee has the ability to um, impose a condition regarding um, uh, regarding the front yard. I, I will say that in this case, it's interlock. It's not uniformly asphalt. So I think that they could probably make case that this is walkway. I see. All right. So we really are looking forward to those uh, to those amendments, revisions to the bylaw, which make it very clear that um, that you can't build with, you know, I think even for lots that are less than a certain frontage, you can't, you can't even uh, add the, um, add the walkway a lot parallel to the driveway anymore so that we can get away from exactly this kind of, um, this kind of circumstance. So um, I see Mr. Mr. Chown would like to speak. So if, if I may, Madam Chair, I think you're absolutely right. The amendments that have uh, gone to planning committee and are going to council next week are intended to prevent uh, the uh, treatment of the front yards that you're seeing in the photograph that was um, provided uh, uh, by the resident of the neighborhood. We, it, it might assist the committee if we were to show you a different photograph. So if the committee coordinator wouldn't mind putting up, I think the first photograph that Mr. West uh, provided to the committee in our package. Uh, was there one before or maybe is, well, that okay. will suffice. Well, that one's pretty clear to me, Mr. Yep. Mr. Yep. Chow. That, that I think Ms. Will... Ramirez had it right, yeah. The, exactly. The, so, um, unfortunately, and I'll use that word, unfortunately, the bylaw as it 
is today and as it was when the building permit was issued and when final inspections were done on this property didn't prevent homeowners from establishing, in this case, the walkway from the front door to the street immediately adjacent to the driveway. And so it's fully conforming to the zoning bylaw today that would not conform to the zoning bylaw as of next week. So with all due respect, I don't think it's appropriate for the committee to impose a condition to require this client to revise his landscaping in accordance with a zoning bylaw that doesn't exist today. We, we couldn't do this um, next week, but today that's a legally conforming driveway and walkway. Thank you. I think, no, no, Ms. Lickling, I'm not gonna go back to the public at this point. In fact, I'd like to wrap this up. Um, I think we've heard enough. We know, we know what direction we're going in on this. We know what we essentially have uh, as, um, as I guess, uh, the, the circumstances, the zoning by the official plan. We, we've got a really good handle on what's before us right now and, uh, and how some of this, um, how some of this did happen. And unfortunately, some of what we were talking about just now really doesn't have anything to do with the application at the end of the day. So um, I think we're done our public portion. I don't, I didn't say anybody else. So uh, I'm looking for the committee's um, vote on this, uh, both the consent application and the minor variance application. So all those in favor of both applications, if we can deal with them both at the same time, all in favor? All right, okay, thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and Mr. White. I like the T-shirt in the background. Mr. T yeah, okay, so Mr. Chan, just let me let me finish up. Um, so, I, for the record, I need to uh, to make sure that because we're not in the council chambers, it's harder for uh, committee staff to actually um, know how everyone's voting. And because I do the call, I actually have to say at the end, for the record, it is unanimous, so that so that they have that for their decision purposes. So. Um, and I just want to make sure then uh, that, and I'm going to direct my comments to Mr. West. Mr. West, you're aware of all of the conditions and you have no, um, no questions or any issues to raise in regards to those conditions? That's correct. We're fine with the conditions listed. All right. I just wanted to make sure that we, uh, that we got back to that. So with that, yes. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your, your uh, very good presentation, Mr. West. Um, you, uh, you provided a lot of um, a, a, good, you know, a, a good array of information that we typically look for, so that's great. Okay, and thank you to Mr. Church and uh, Ms. Blakeney. We do appreciate the time, and it is getting late, so we, we appreciate the time that you take in your evenings to, uh, to uh, address, uh, address the panel with some of your concerns. So thank you. Have a good evening. We're going to move on at this point to application. I believe I'm almost uh, thinking we go back to our normal, um, our normal sort of list on the agenda. So let's go with number one. And we will hear from, I guess I'm looking for Mr. Makarenko. Mr. Makarenko, I hope I'm getting that right. Yeah, uh, good evening. It's uh, Arthur Scudia joining. All right, so the speaker, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, you're right. You're, I, I, it, my, uh, my mistake. So the agent is you, Mr. Sorry, your last name is yeah, Suja? 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 Is that it? Mr. Suja, did we lose you? We just lost him. Oh, no. Maybe coming back. Let's give him a minute. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right. Did you want to stitch? Uh, perfect. Okay. So my apologies. I just realized you are the uh, agent for the application and Mr. Makarenko is uh, someone who's on my speaker's list. Yeah, when we get to the public right. portion. So, uh, so I, I am the agent uh, I, and together with my wife, uh, we own the uh, property. So I'm, I'm right. acting as my own agent and I'm overwhelmed by some of the presentations. 
Okay, well, we're just going to ask you to give us a quick overview of your proposal. Sure, if you could. Uh, so I, I just like to highlight to the committee and, and also to the interested parties that, uh, you know, some of the considerations we've, we've taken into account. Uh, our goal is to be completely transparent, to conform to all the requirements for legal dwellings, and, and also to take into uh, account the uh, desirable character of the uh, neighborhood. Um, I see the screen has changed. Uh, can everyone still hear me? Yes, of course. Yeah, we can hear you. And um, did you want to explain? So what did you submit for presentation purposes? Was this it? Well, um, I submitted a, a document, just an additional owner comments document uh, that um, addressed some of the uh, concerns that had been raised by the, uh, the stakeholders, uh, raised by, by some of the, uh, the neighbors. And I was um, prepared just to walk through that, uh, walk through the document I submitted. All right, so can you just give us a quick brief overview though of what you're proposing to do? Sure. Uh, a bit of history? This is a, a dual semi-detached property located on Iris Street. It is directly adjacent to the Iris Station and, and looking forward to the future LRT station. So it's right adjacent to it. We are, the basements are unfinished and we are looking for permission to uh, extend the legal non-conforming use to uh, renovate the basements to put in uh, secondary dwelling units for each of the primary residences. All right, and and you, you, secondary okay. dwelling units. And you have provided um, you have provided the the um, the material required to substantiate the legal nonconformity and all of that, right? I think we've seen that. Yes, yes, I have, and, and um, you know, I've reviewed the the submissions uh, by uh, Ms. Ramirez as as well as the other stakeholders, and um, some of the uh, some of the concerns that uh, were raised, um, and I, I was prepared to comment on that uh, if you wish. Uh, well, what I'd like to maybe is to get uh, get some sense of what your consultation was with uh, sure. with neighbors, and then you can maybe address some of the concerns that you heard. Sure. So with this with this particular property, uh, there is is only one house that borders uh, directly adjacent to the property. That's uh, eleven seventy six Adirondack. We did consult the owner. The owner had uh, no objection. To this, um, we also consulted um, across the, the street uh, the people that were living in that property as well. So we, we consulted um, people living in the uh, Im immediate area. All right. And what did you hear? I mean, so we know we have quite a few. Uh, like I count somewhere around six, seven, eight. Um, submissions that are opposed to your proposal. So can yeah. you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's correct there. And, and there was uh, one, uh, one submission that was supportive of, of the proposal. Um, I, I, uh, the main concerns that have been raised um, are tied to parking, uh, occupancy requirements, pro and property maintenance. And with respect, to those uh, those considerations, you know, big, um, <clears throat> apparently uh, also there was a, a flyer distributed by someone in the neighborhood encouraging residents to um, uh, oppose their uh, concern. But I, I don't know that that's relevant. Uh, I'd like to no, address. Not really. It's not really relevant. I really just want to hear about the concerns sure. and how you're addressing so, them. As I can see. Um, this is located right at the uh, intersection of Iris and Adirondack. We recognize it is a very busy intersection. Concern is having these secondary dwelling units in the basement will add to the traffic and, and will make the parking situation worse. Um, the point we wanted to bring up is that it's our understanding that uh, as per zoning bylaw 109 section four, and, and as per the planning um, submission, there is no parking required in this case. We have, however, considered it. Uh, the leases we have limit parking. The original driveway as, as uh, uh, designed, driveway and site layout as designed in 1958 
um, has room for multiple cars. We limit the number of cars to one in the lease. Uh, and so there is would be space in the, uh, in the driveways for um, uh, an occupant in the SD uh, used to park. So it would not impact street parking because they would have a sp uh, space. Being right adjacent to the uh, state uh, Irish station in LRT, it's very attractive for, for people who don't own cars. We also provide uh, secure bicycle storage uh, as well. So that was the, uh, the, the um, common theme of the objections raised was parking and, uh, and impact. With respect, to, uh, another comment was with respect to the uh, building design and, and uh, occupancy. Um, we are uh, conforming with building code re requirements. Um, with respect to the one bedroom uh, apartments, again, there are specific code requirements for the uh, occupancy, which uh, we are conforming to. Concerns about additional residents, these are one bedroom apartments. Uh, were consistent with the occupancy requirements as well as our insurance requirements, which limit occupancy to uh, to one couple. Um, so um, that's something we're taking into account as well. Uh, in terms of, of property management, concerns raised about um, for maintenance and absentee landlords. We actually live 10 minutes away from the property. Uh, my wife and I, uh, with the help from our 19-year-old twin boys, take pride in maintaining the property. Uh, and, and our sons have already expressed interest in, in living there when they finish uh, university. Um, uh, other, other considerations, uh, green space, there's no, no uh, impact. And it's uh, our, our view uh, that um, this proposal is consistent with the City of Ottawa official plan. Um, it, uh, the location facilitates the use of public transit, cycling, and it also increases the availability of uh, affordable housing. All right, thank you, Mr. Skuja. I hope I'm getting that right. Any questions for the applicant? Okay, I, uh, I see none. So, um, all right, in terms of uh, people on my speakers list, I see Mr. Marikin, sorry, Mr. Makarenko. Bankarenko, thank you. So please, your comments for the committee. Okay, so I'm a resident of Irish Street for 30 years, and I'm a novice to city politics and procedures in that context. Madam Chair and others, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Irish Street is already busy with cars and more recently more bicycles, scooters, and other forms of transportation. I raise this issue as over because intense parking on Iris is making bicycling more difficult and dangerous than it's ever been. Street parking on Iris Street has already been reduced by 50% with a relatively recent uh, installation of the side rock on one side of the street, and that caused the removal of street parking on, that, on the south side of the street. Uh, numerous new rental homes, the transitway parking, people parking to use the transitway, uh, Government of Canada employees, parking on iris uh, instead of paying for their parking at their buildings have all further congested street parking in iris and some of the neighboring streets uh, parking will become a further problem once the lrt is in place parking is minimal on this property and will overflow onto the street as we've seen on other newly formed rental properties uh, despite uh, i think the best intentions of uh, uh, of the landlord, um, people will have more cars and they will and they will park on the street. Bylaw enforcement of parking problems, as was raised earlier by others, after the fact is really ineffective. Uh, trust me, the enforcement process is not not really designed to in, you know, clean up uh, parking problems. It just doesn't work. The root cause is if you put more people with cars into a property that property parking cannot support, they will overflow into the neighborhood. Uh, we have R1 zoning rules for a reason. Uh, variations should only be approved if they support the nature of the neighborhood and benefit the residents of that neighborhood. Uh, with respect and compassion, the reality is that our councillor is MIA right now and the, and the council is generally favorable to any intensification. The city's track record on this is poor. 
Although this application may seem very tiny, this committee is our neighborhood's front line to the slippery slope of intensification. And it was a learning experience for me to sit through the previous presentations and just how slippery that slippery slope is. Mr. Church and Ms. Blakeney earlier characterized the situation well. The neighborhood has lost one parking spot, one meter at a time. I don't want to wait until Iris Street is totally overwhelmed with parking problems before pushing back. Other neighborhoods have waited too long and now there is a no intensification revolution occurring in many of those other neighborhoods. Again, the R1 zoning rules are there for a reason. Unless there is a community benefit to this change, I would oppose this application and respectfully request that the committee reject it. Stick to the existing zoning rules. Whether you're willing to take up that task or not, the committee, you the committee are our frontline defense to the slippery slope of potential eventual degradation of our neighborhood. Without you, who will stand up for the existing residents? Please stand up for us, reject the application, push it up to council if you have to, and force them to be visibly accountable. That is what I'm asking. Uh, with that, I will conclude my presentation and thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for that, um, for your comments, Mr. Makarenko. Any questions for our speaker? All right, okay. So um, I, guess, I guess I will make just a couple of comments. Um, I, I, I guess I, I hear you as well in terms of um, how sometimes it looks like, you know, it's, it's death by a million cuts. Again, same comment though, you know, we really do need to look at these applications um, uh, individually. And what's being proposed here to be, to be quite honest is becoming um, an as of right situation elsewhere in the city. So, um, and I, and I have to admit, I don't know that I quite agree with you that being next to an LRT station will actually result in more parking. If that's true, then there's another issue going on. Uh, then that's, that's outside of this intensification trend. There's, there's, it's not an intensification issue, it's another issue. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm just saying that I don't believe that you can associate that kind of, of maybe maybe occurrence with with intensification. So, so on that, I guess um, I'm looking uh, for anyone else in the audience who might want to comment on this application, either for or against. And I'm not seeing anybody raise their hands on this. So I guess committee, I'm looking for a vote at this particular point sure. in time. Yeah, Ms. Mr. White. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Just, uh, I, I have a question for staff. The R10 zoning, the only permitted residential use, so am I correct in saying that it's single single detached residential? Ooh, Madam Chair, yes. Um, detached dwellings are only permitted in the residential first area, first density area. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, I'd just like to uh, comment that the zoning, being that the zoning permits um, a single detached residential unit, would normally permit a single detached residential unit. I recognize we're dealing with a legal non-conforming situation here where we have a uh, semi-detached dwelling that was built prior to the adoption of the original zoning bylaw. Um, however, I think it's pretty clear to me that the intent of the zoning bylaw, the R10 zoning, which is I guess been in effect for quite some time is to permit only single detached residential uses and to and in fact I, I think to promote the development of single detached residential uses in other words to um, to see non-conforming properties uh, eventually redeveloped to conform that's my understanding of an intent of a zoning that's been in particularly one that's been in effect for that kind of length of time it being that uh, if the if the R10 zoning, if this was a single detached residential unit on the on the on the lot, even with the uh, recent amendments to the zoning bylaw to permit secondary dwelling units, we would ultimately end up with two dwelling units on this property. If that is, if uh, if the development conformed to the R10 zoning, the current proposal is for an increase in the number of 
dwelling units on the property to a total of four, four units and still retaining the single detached residential zoning. Um, I, I'm, I'm concerned that our, our, our obligation in this, in, in this, in a deciding on this application is, is under the section of the planning act with respect to granting permission for a uh, purpose that in the, and I'll quote directly from the, from the uh, planning act, purpose that in the opinion of the committee is similar to the purpose for which it was used on the day the bylaw was passed. And in that case, it was two dwelling units in the form of a, a non-conforming semi-detached or for a use that is more compatible with the uses permitted by the bylaw than the purpose for which it was used on the day the bylaw was passed. In other words, for something that's in more conformity or closer to the development of single detached residential. Um, I'm having a really hard time. I'm, in my opinion, I think what we're dealing with here in this case, and I have to agree, I think with Mr. Makarenko, that uh, we're dealing with something more than our jurisdiction. I think it's something that needs to be considered at a council level in terms of a zoning bylaw amendment to bring this, uh, to bring some conformity or legal conformity to the existing development before we start um, granting permissions for doubling the number of dwelling units that would be normally permitted under the zoning. And on that basis, I'm not going to support the application. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wright. No one else? Ms. Willis. A question for staff, Madam Chair. Um, can you, uh, no, what's my question? Um, what would it have been that triggered the need for this application um, given that there don't seem to be any external alterations to the building. I'm wondering, um, Ms. Ramirez, whether you can explain what brought this uh, nonconformity to the attention of the city. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, the nonconformity was brought to the attention of the city because the use is intensifying, the residential use is intensifying by adding the um, secondary dwelling unit. So, it was my understanding that it's mandated that secondary dwelling units are permitted in all semi-detached units. So given its non-conforming status, aside from a housekeeping matter, I'm just having trouble why it would be invoked right. in this um, instance. Uh, I understand um, your question. Um, through you, Madam Chair, the zoning provision is written so that they're permitted in um, attached units where that unit is a permitted use within that zone. Okay. Mr. Hindle, did you want to weigh in on this in any way? No, I think I'm all right with this. I think it, there's a lot of this intensification is very clearly encouraged in this location and I, I don't see um, any issues with it and it, Tech, while it's technically an expansion of a, a legal non-conforming use, I think it's that's very much a technicality in this case, and I'm I'm supportive of it. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, and so I guess we we need to go to a vote then at this point. So I need to know all. I know Mr. Mr. White. I already know where you are. Uh, all others, are you in favor? Just raise your hand if you are. Okay. Um, so the application then is uh, granted uh, and uh, with a, a note for the record that uh, there's a dissent by Mr. White and I believe it's, and you can correct me Mr. White, but I believe is that you don't, uh, you don't think that the proposal meets the zoning, uh, the intent of the, of the zoning bylaw. And because of that, um, that you, you feel that we're, I guess, overstepping our jurisdiction to a, sec a certain extent as a result of that needs to be dealt with at a higher level. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if it is to be approved, in my opinion, we're dealing with what should be a zoning amendment. As Mr. I think Mr. Makarenko has suggested bumping it up to, to council. All right, thank you. And I, and from just from my standpoint, I, I actually think that the provisions in the Planning Act that provide the ability to do this is, is probably for us to, to debate exactly these kinds of things 
is this appropriate? Is this what is this what was envisioned for the Planning Act? And uh, and in my case, I happen to believe that this is within the reasonable test, and uh, and so I am supporting it as I'm supporting it uh, along with uh, with my other colleagues. Okay, so I believe that's it. I don't think there's there's no conditions. There's nothing else that we need to do with this. But I would, um, yeah, uh, just communicate with your neighbors, Mr. Uh, Scooja, because I think it's uh, for them. You know, I wouldn't want them to think that some of the issues that might come up are related to your your uh, secondary units when they may not be. So uh, stay in touch with them. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Okay, we're going to go to application number three next, which is uh, 207 Pleasant Park. And who have I got for that application? Robinson. Hey, Mr. Robinson, I see that you're there. Good evening. All right, I'll need from you uh, an oath or solemn declaration on your signposting because my understanding is you do not have one in. That is so correct. do do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted first at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and that it was clearly visible and legible for the entirety of that time. Do you either swear or affirm that to be true? I do swear. All right, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Robinson. Um, I'm mindful of the of the hour at this point, so I'm gonna ask you to do a brief presentation of, uh, of the proposal, please, if you would. Okay. I did uh, file a PowerPoint uh, presentation, if that could be brought up. Thank you. So, um, this is a property in the Alta Vista neighborhood. It is 207 Pleasant Park. It is near the bottom of the uh, extract from uh, Geo Ottawa. Um, it is bounded on the south by Pleasant Park Road and on the west by Cavendish Road. There is a single family home on the property closer to Pleasant Park. And then the other building that's shown in a gray outline on the building, on the lot, is a detached garage um, and it has its own driveway to Cavendish Road and also on the left hand side of the house itself there is a driveway it doesn't show on this but I'll show you in the photos there is a driveway that leads uh, in off Cavendish Road uh, to the house itself and there is also a, dry, a single car driveway in off uh, Pleasant Park Road. Cavendish Road um, that is shown on the uh, on the map is a one-way southbound road. Um, the application before you is to sever the property into two parcels almost equal in size uh, to keep the existing house that is on the property and to allow a new single family home to be built that would be zoning compliant. Thank you very much. That is the um, that's the existing situation. So you can see um, at the bottom is Pleasant Park Road. On the left, uh, with quite a bit of detail, is Cavendish uh, Road. And then there are also two entrances, uh, two driveways to Cavendish Road. Um, one going to a, garage, a detached garage, and then one going, uh, it's a bit of a depressed driveway, going uh, to a, a garage uh, within the house itself. And on the Pleasant Park frontage, there is a single car driveway. When um, this property is one of the properties throughout Alta Vista that has um, alternative uh, zoning uh, provisions that allow a severance to be uh, permitted on a lot of this size at roughly equal in size each of the lots, um, the requirements are that each uh, the retained and the uh, severed parcel, the homes need to front onto different streets for their access. And uh, one of the conditions in the planning department's uh, list of conditions is that we are to close off the uh, driveway access that leads to the house itself. Um, when we first started discussing this application, 
with the planning department, there were two uh, issues that came up and they are somewhat interrelated. One is that the north half of the overall lot, uh, which is where the new home would be, that would have frontage onto Cavendish. Uh, there are not existing uh, municipal services along Cavendish. They are on Pleasant Park. So we would need to extend the services, which would be a water main and a, a sanitary sewer beneath uh, Cavendish itself. We have provided drawings to the uh, planning department and the engineering uh, infrastructure department to show how that could be done beneath Cavendish itself. And that uh, the design and the cost and the uh, reinstatement of the road itself up to the point at which the services would then uh, go towards the new house uh, would be solely our client's uh, responsibility. They would also have to post securities for this. This is, a, this is uh, the drawing showing the proposed uh, severance. So it's a horizontal line, uh, roughly parallel with Pleasant Park and almost uh, halfway up the, uh, the depth of the lot. Um, one of the issues, uh, another issue was about the, the status of Cavendish uh, Lane itself. Uh, it was determined through our client's lawyer and also confirmed by the city legal, the city right of way and city planning that Cavendish is a full municipal road. It was deemed a public highway as long ago as 1897. Um, and it is uh, one way southbound. The uh, right of way is approximately eight meters wide. And within that about three and a half meters is the actual travel portion. And if you can see um, just to the left of the lane itself, there is a, uh, a garage on the next property. And then there is a fence that uh, roughly parallels the west edge of, um, of Cavendish itself. That is uh, up to a meter and a half encroaching onto uh, the right of way, and that's a fence that I, I assume is used as the east, uh, the east fence line of the house to the west. So it was uh, confirmed to us and, and we, we got that all confirmed that uh, Cavendish is a municipal road. It's plowed in the winter, uh, school buses uh, use it. Um, it uh, there is no question that, that that is a road and that seems to be one of the issues that has been raised uh, by neighbors but the, the policies uh, allow this type of development. The planning department is in, is in full support of it. Uh, it meets the, the lot area requirements. And what we're asking for now is to approve the um, part one as a, as a separate lot and part two as a separate lot. And then we would go through the design process to finalize uh, the design of the extension of the services. That also needs a, an approval from the Ministry of the Environment for an extension of services and we know we have to do that within the year and then afterwards get a building permit for a single family home that would be zoning compliant. So I'm here to answer any questions that may be uh, there. Uh, my client, uh, he and his wife uh, visited nearby neighbors uh, a few weeks ago. They went to uh, 213 uh, Pleasant Park, which is the property immediately to the east. They went to uh, 199 uh, Pleasant Park, which is the property on the other side of Cavendish Road. They spoke to the family at 186 uh, Billings Avenue, which is the property uh, just above uh, this property. Um, and then they also spoke to the property right across the street, which is 212 Pleasant Park. They did go at the same time that they were going to those properties, they did knock on the door at 197. Uh, Pleasant Park, but uh, there was not anybody at home or, or, or nobody answered the door. I contacted, um, separately, I contacted the Alta Vista Community Association uh, through an email correspondence outlined what we were planning to do. They got back to me fairly quickly saying that their zoning committee had had a look at this and that they did not have any comments or issues at this time. Uh, as you can see, uh, the planning department are in support. And we've had a look at the, uh, the conditions of approval and uh, I don't believe that there's any that uh, are a surprise and we're ready to uh, clear those conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Um, questions for Mr. Robinson, Mr. Wright. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question with respect to the servicing extension that's going to be, that's proposed to be um, along, uh, introduced on Cavendish Road. I'm assuming that will be a full public uh, services extension. In other words, the, the, the services would ultimately be assumed by uh, the municipality and maintained by the municipality. Is that correct? That is correct. When we first started discussing it with um, uh, planning department and the infrastructure group, we did uh, talk about uh, having it instead of uh, beneath uh, Cavendish itself to be in a right of way uh, that would be completely on um, the, the west edge of the, the lot where the existing home would be um, through some, and it would be uh, parts on a plan that would be submitted at the same time as this. And it was uh, indicated to us by uh, infrastructure and planning that that was not the preferred option. They want to uh, be able to assume it and maintain it. And if anything goes wrong with it, then they have the ability to uh, fix it. So uh, it would be beneath Cavendish itself and it would be municipally assumed. Uh, thank you. Follow up, Madam Chair. Um, would, would, that, would that extension of the services um, uh, allow for a possible future redevelopment of other parcels along that Cavendish Road frontage to enable them to connect to the services? Is that, is that, in, is that part of the planned extension that the city is, uh, is proposing or pro promoting? Sorry, did you get that? Is it, is it, was that a question for me? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, it, we have had no indication that anybody else was wanting to up, upgrade. I don't know how much more, like if, if a 50 millimeter water main does it for one house, is a 60 millimeter do it for two houses or three houses? I know that, um, and there's indication in the submissions that have, maybe you've had a chance to look at, that approximately 30 years ago, um, a, a, a severance application was was contemplated on the property to the west and was was refused. I don't know 30 years ago if they were requiring the level of detail that we have to go through. And I don't believe that 30 years ago they had the this special zoning provision that would allow these corner lot uh, severances. So we have not been given any indication that we need to upside, like oversize it. So, so the so the the servicing extension is is planned to be sized only to accommodate your development it uh, maybe we have not maybe, sorry maybe staff can help here as well all right mr hodgins uh through you madam chair i am under the impression that it will be to a municipal standard and it won't just be for servicing the subject property the actual requirements of which i am not uh, aware of our infrastructure staff do not provide me with what um, sizing would be required only that they would enter into a development agreement with the city to conduct such extensions. Um, I will say that this alternative corner lot provision only applies to the lot on the left um, 199 Pleasant Park I believe the two lots uh, further down Cavendish, Cavendish Lane do not have that zoning designation and would not be permitted to use that corner lot provision. Um, that being said, they, they could still redevelop in theory, but just for clarification, only this lot and the one immediately adjacent um, have that zoning designation for the alternative corner lot provision. So essentially we're, we're, only, we're only dealing with potential, uh, with the, the existing <laughs> application as far as planned potential for this uh, servicing concept. Is that, is that correct? Through you, Madam Chair, it's difficult to say exactly. In theory, the other lands could be rezoned or, or otherwise, but as it currently stands, only the two properties have that designation. I don't know if the other property upon a severance would be sized appropriately, but they do have the designation to make the use of the same provisions. That should it be but when you say the other two properties, is that the is that the one to the I guess to the north? Correct. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, 174 billings and 186 billings are included in Schedule 344, which would prohibit them from making use of the alternative corner lot provisions. Whereas 199 Pleasant Park is included, or excluded, sorry, from Schedule 344, and therefore they'd be permitted to make use of the corner lot provisions. So, so sorry, 
only 207 uh, Pleasant Park and 186 Billings then are the ones? No, parties? sorry, 199 Pleasant Park and 207 Pleasant Park. Okay, this is the, on the opposite side of the, of the laneway. Okay. So whatever's to the north, not, right? So it, it's, a, it's a strange situation, isn't it? Well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I would expect that if you're going to extend services, uh, why not extend them right through, but I'm not the engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ms. Willis. Uh, just a, a clarification for the applicant. Um, given the, as I read it, the requirement for this law severance is that the existing house will take its access off Pleasant Park only, and the new house will take its access, vehicular access off Cavendish. So does that mean that the existing access off Pleasant Park doesn't lead to a garage, it just comes up beside the house if I'm looking at uh, Google properly. So is it the applicant's intent to, to remove the garage and close the driveway as part of this, uh, part of this application? Um, within the year, we need to remove the existing detached garage that is in the, the in, on the lot that where the new home would be. Mm -hmm. And then as well on the west side of the existing house, there is a driveway and it uh, is a depressed driveway that leads to uh, a garage door. And that has to be closed off within the year so that a year from now, there will only be one uh, means of access for the existing house, and that is to be from Pleasant Park. And the means of access for the new lot will be from Cavendish. And that's one of the, uh, as, as uh, I guess uh, Ms. Trombley said, this, this section in the bylaw is quite, quite complicated and the mapping uh, is hard to figure out. But um, at the end of the day, we need to have each, each house has to have its vehicular access from a different street. And, they, if, and in the existing house, we have to close off a driveway and we have to remove a garage and its driveway. All right, thank you, because th those are conditions. Ms. Yes. Ms. Willis, I don't know if you noticed, but they're actually part of the conditions of approval. They were, I was a bit confused about the order of events in the staff comment about applications and, and uh, conditions. So <laughs> I just wanted to confirm that that was the case. All right, any other questions for Mr. Robinson on this application? All right, I'm going to go. I do have a speaker, somebody who registered today, Monsieur Philippe Roy. Do we have Monsieur Philippe Roy with us this evening? <clears throat> Mr. Philippe Roy is, uh, I don't see him, but he's uh, 197 Pleasant Park. <laughs> He does not appear to be on the attendees list. Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Williams. Uh, in that case, I'm going to open it up to anyone at this point. Does anybody want to speak to uh, this application, either for or against? All right. I'm not seeing anybody. Okay. So, panel, I guess I'm looking for those in support of the application. All right. Okay. So for the record, Mr. Robinson, the application is unanimously granted. Uh, you have a long list of conditions. Anything you'd like to raise at this particular point in time? Um, can we remove them all? <laughs> Not likely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so if you're good with them, great. Thank you so much uh, for Thank your you. presentation. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye bye. You too. Bye now. Bye. All right. So, where are we here? Three. I, I think I'm going to skip number four and go to number five. And I'm looking for in number five, I think it's Mr. Paquette. If I, yes, Mr. Paquette, are you, uh, are you around? Okay. So, Mr. Paquette, um, I'm gonna wait till we can see you. Hi there, how are you doing? So listen, one of the reasons why we had put you not in the fast track, but in the presentation side was because 
we wanted to really understand her application, but we've got a number of other applications for which we've got um, public delegations and we have no one for yours. So let's get a presentation from you. I'm gonna ask you to tailor it specifically to the stratified pieces because when we looked at the, uh, at the material that, that you submitted, to be honest with you, um, it wasn't clear, not to me in any event, what it is <clears throat> that we're stratifying. And, you know, the kinds of things I was kind of hoping for, to be honest with you, is a cross-section. Did you submit a cross-section of this in any way? Did I miss that? Yeah. Um, can I go ahead now? Yes, you can, but can you answer my question? Do, do you have Yeah, a you'll see uh, uh, there is a drawing. The reference plan does have a cross-section. Okay. All right. Then show me that because I, I certainly couldn't see it. Okay, so, but if you go back, to, I'd like to just talk about the site plan for a second. Okay. If you can go to the previous drawing. <clears throat> okay, thank you, by the way. Uh, good on you guys to uh, have all this energy late into the evening. I'm pretty <laughs> impressed. And by the way, I'm working from a remote location because I've got no power at home. Oh no. But anyway, it's not the end of the world. I have a friend who accommodated me, being very nice. So here we are. I'm sorry, so, Madam Chair. Yes. It's the statutory de declaration oath. I beg your pardon? I don't believe I heard you. We need the sworn oath for the declaration. Ah, thank you, thank you. Okay, <laughs> didn't catch thank that. Thank you. All right, so Mr. Paquette, yes. All right, before we go too much further, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applied and that it was posted for the prescribed number of days prior to the hearing and that it was at all times visible and uh, legible? Do you swear I, that to be true or affirm that to be true? Uh, it is true. I swear that, that what you read is correct. All right. Thank you. So, um, all right. Back to your site plan. Okay, so the severance uh, is for towers three and four. And basically that's the fundamental application before you is to allow for construction financing to be registered on tower three. And uh, that is uh, the next tower to be built. They've already excavated and uh, are gonna be pulling a permit very soon. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's the first thing the severance applications do, uh, chop up three and four. The second thing they do is that they create easements because the way it works is that to get to the tower three garage, you got to go down the tower two ramp. And then from there at the P1 level, you cross over to tower three. And so that's the, uh, and then, and then through tower three, uh, the tower folks, the tower four uh, garage also gains access through the easements that will be created in, uh, in the tower three garage. So now if you go to the next drawing, uh, okay, that's just the detail of the tower three. If, I, if you can go to the reference plan, please. Yep, so it would be the next drawing. <clears throat> yeah. And if you zoom in, uh, the, 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 um, the, to your question on the uh, cross sections, they're all sitting at the bottom of the drawing. Oh, um, so, so if you go <laughs> to the bottom, no, not that one, but if you go right to the bottom right there, to your left there, yeah. So though that shows you where in the garage those parts are. Um, and uh, so that's, that's an answer to your question. Now, if you move the, if you shift the screen to the, uh, just a little bit to the right um, and up and to the right again, <clears throat> a little bit more, just I wanna focus just a little more to the right, right there. And if you could zoom in on that a little bit, <clears throat> 
Okay, so what you're seeing there is really the guts of the uh, access easements. What you're seeing is, uh, oops, if you can zoom back to what you had there. Yeah, right there. If you can stay right there, please. Uh, so basically what you have is <clears throat> part four is at the P1 level of tower three. So again, you've come down the ramp in tower two. You've cut across. Now you're on the part four, which is a, uh, which is a driveway, gives you access. Um, and then you get to part five, where you uh, could do a bit of visitor parking, and then you've got pedestrian access to tower four. Uh, part six is uh, for uh, parking in favor of tower four. So those parts, four, five, and six, are easements being created at the P1 level for the benefit of giving the residents of tower four access and parking to uh, their uh, lot. And so that's the, uh, that's the strata, that's the underground stuff. Now, if you uh, go back to the left um, on the same drawing, if you just shift to the left, please, <clears throat> further to get the uh, sense right, right there. If you could zoom in there. <clears throat> Uh, the, the other easements that are being created is uh, over part two, access and, and services are over part two lands, which are uh, part of the part, uh, part of the tower three. The tower three is made up of lots of uh, parts one through six. So uh, services and access through part two gets you over to uh, the tower four lands, which is part seven and eight. So that's the other easement. And then finally, there's um, an easement in favor of the Tower 3 folks, which is on part seven. So now you do the roundabout. And so now you're on Tower 4 lands. So we, had to we have to secure an easement on part seven so that uh, Tower 3 folks can use a portion of Tower 4 lands to get to where they're going. And so that is a summary of all the easements. Again, the fundamental application for you is to chop up tower three and four into two pieces. We're doing that with those parts. Tower three is gonna have parts one through six. Tower four is gonna have parts seven and eight, but they're joined at the hip. They're married with these access, parking and service connections. And everything you see in front of you is uh, simpatico with the Recently, well, not recently, it was approved. So we have site plan approval for that first drawing I showed you. Uh, that was site plan approved in December of 2019. So this is a, um, a reference plan that comes straight out of that approved site plan. And uh, there you have it. All right, thank you. Uh, that, at least for me, was helpful. I have a much better idea of what's going on. Is anybody else, uh, like, does somebody have questions for, uh, for Mr. Paquette? Yes, uh, Ms. Willis. Um, Mr. Paquette, just um, would this, do these buildings each constitute or will they constitute a separate condominium corporation or is the, is there, are they all separate entities? They, through, through you, Madam Chair, each of the condos is its own condo. Uh, but they are all going to be uh, tied with the joint use and maintenance agreement. So and have I, you gone through a condominium, plans of condominium for this as well as site plan approval? Uh, the condominium application will be filed um, soon, but it has not been filed yet. Okay, so, okay. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Mr. Pickett, Mr. Hindle? Um, yeah, so I'm just curious, um, I noticed that there's a planned new access once Tower 4 is constructed. So in this case, are the, the subsurface easements intended to be used only temporarily through Tower 2, or is this a long-term solution? It's, uh, okay, if you, thank you for the question. If you go to the site plan, um, because it'll help. That first drawing we had up would be nice to share it with everybody now. Um, it shows that access to Tower 4. Um, okay, we can talk through it if it's not there. 
Uh, but basically, yeah, in the end, um, oh, I see something's coming. <clears throat> in the end, we end up with uh, two uh, ramps that serve collectively two, three, and four. So for the interim, as Tower 3 is going to be the next building to go up, um, everybody goes down Tower 2 ramp uh, and then gets into Tower 3. But when Tower 4 goes up, uh, we've got an extra ramp there. And so the Tower 4 folks will go straight into that ramp. But it also gives the option for the Tower 3 folks to double back and come into their property as well. They're, they'll have reciprocal easement rights there as well. Um, so that the intent is to treat uh, towers two, three, and four as a collective parking. Um, uh, they all have their own assigned parking, but in terms of access to each other's parking on their respective lands, they'll have two ramps to access those. Okay. In the in the fullness of time. Yeah. So is the intention then in future once tower four is constructed or substantially underway? to come back for easements, at least in favor of Tower 3 for the subsurface areas of Tower 4 for that ramp yes. access? Yes, that would be correct. OK. No, I was just curious because uh, I noticed that there was a comments, some comments from one of the, the condominium corporations, I think Tower 2, concerned about that, that ongoing access. But it sounds yeah. like it's always been designed that way. It, it's been designed that way since, uh, I think, 2000, well, basically, for many years. Okay, no, that's it. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Brickett, I just noticed there is a, a bit of a housekeeping amendment to your application to the notice that we need to uh, need to address. So uh, again, a very simple one in terms of the zoning reference, it's R5A exception 2605 with, I guess, an additional qualifier S405 you're aware we're making that change to the uh, to the notice. You got me there. I got you there. Well, right, just say yes. <laughs> I well, honestly, it's, it's just it's, it's a minor it's a minor <clears throat> change to the zoning, right? So the the reference the reference to the zoning. Okay, and this is uh, okay. Oh, I see. So someone corrected the actual nomenclature of the zoning on the notice. Yes. I'll take. Uh, I'll, I'll roll the dice. I'll have to accept that. All right. Okay. Well, we have uh, Ms. Ramirez is very capable. So she's uh, <laughs> typically she doesn't miss these things. So I yeah. think uh, yeah. I think I think we're yeah, pretty good, good there. She's very good. Okay. Um, all right. I have no speakers on this. If there's no more questions from the panel, I'll call whether or not there's anyone out in the audience who would like to speak either for or against this application. I'm not seeing anything. All in favor of the application? All right, so Mr. Paquette, the application is, is unanimously granted. So um, I guess we'll, we'll see you again when you're back uh, later on in this development. The only thing to be perfectly honest, give me a separate elevation of the stratified areas so that I can follow it better than I, I didn't even notice them at the bottom of that drawing. So, um, um, yeah, you okay. know what? Um, I feel the same way. Okay. I, my, my surveyor kind of like uh, painted me into a corner and just, that's what he gave me. And, uh, everybody with this COVID is like, I don't know, they're not doing extra work. That's for sure. And so that's what I had to work with. All right. Well, Okay, so hopefully the next time around we're we're at we're all on the other end and people are are uh, are are going to give you the elevations you need. So, anyway, that's it. There's only one there's only one condition. It's a joint use and maintenance agreement, yeah. and I'm sure there's no issue, right? Cool. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Now you can get home where there's no electricity. You should think yeah, about no, that. No, there's still no there's still no there's still no power at home, and uh, my wife said we won't get it until tomorrow morning. So. I just hope the uh, fridge is still working because I want to have a beer when I get home. <laughs> okay, well, I'll wish that for you too. So have a great evening. Okay, I'll be there in a few again. minutes. Okay. All right. Bye now. <laughs> okay, so that's number five. We're going to do number four. Next, number four, I think, is back to where we were.
uh, originally at the outset of the meeting. So Ms. McQuaig, well, I'd like to see you back. Um, we talked a lot about the proposal, to be honest with you. We got, we got into the application a little bit back, uh, back at the outset of the meeting. Um, it is getting late. I'm gonna ask you to do just a very brief presentation, if you could, uh, of, the, um, of the proposal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, oh, I am off mute. Um, my name is Christine McQuaig. I'm the agent on behalf of the owners, uh, Jilu and Christine Stakala. I can just jump, I'll, I'll try and be as quick as possible. You can just jump right into the next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know if it's frozen on my end, but it's still on the- Yeah, front. it seems to take a little while to, to oh. do that. Like it's- um... So the property is located on Marshall Court off of Cunningham Avenue in Alta Vista. Um, the closest major street intersection is obviously Kilbourne and Alta Vista. Um, you can you know, go to the next slide, please. So uh, this is um, obviously showing the, the lot configuration currently. This lot was severed in 2004, or at least 2004 was when the OMB decision was put out. I don't know the actual date that it went to Committee of Adjustment. The severance and variance for reduced lot area was approved and then appealed um, by, by residents, I believe, in the neighborhood at the time, and it did go to the OMB. Um, the OMB decision uh, weighed the evidence and they were persuaded by the opinion of the city planner and uh, the applicants for seeking the severance and they felt that it met all the four tests as per the Planning Act uh, and so the severance stood at that time. So this is another view of the site, sort of a bird's eye view, just showing where it's at today. Obviously it is a, there are some trees on the property currently. And it also gives you kind of an overview of the scale of dwellings that are currently in the area. You can um, flip to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry, there's. Um, so this is a street view of the site, which, uh, I mean, it is hard to see. It's quite overgrown at this point. There are, as I said, trees on the site currently. And as I said in my original remarks when we were discussing the adjournment, a tree conservation report um, has been submitted. It was appended to the site plan that was submitted with the, the variance application that we provided to Committee of Adjustment. Um, it was prepare, prepared by a qualified arborist. These are examples of homes already existing on Marshall Court. Some are single stories, uh, many are two stories, and there are instances as well of double car garages. So just giving a reference point for um, the types and scales of dwellings that are along this street um, to show consistency with what's being proposed. Um, you can skip to the next slide, which is probably, I believe, more area context, and we can probably go beyond that one as well. <clears throat> so there's um, a few more examples along Marshall Court. This is the proposed dwelling two-story, two-car garage, so similar to other dwellings we see on the street. Proposed finishes being stone, stucco, and metal, um, which is also seen on the street as well, similar to the, the black and gray um, scheme that we've seen in another dwelling on the street. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna have to shift my uh, Zoom panel of people here. So this uh, takes us through obviously the zoning statistics that apply to this parcel. Obviously today we are seeking two variances, one for the proposed lot area of 591 square meters. This is the same lot area that was approved previously by Committee of Adjustment and also um, upheld by the OMB in 2004. And it's, an, it's a lot as a right currently. Um, so, so that the lot area sort of is what it is. Um, and the other variance we are seeking is a very minor reduction of about one square meter to the rear yard area. We do note that the lot is a reverse pie shaped lot. So even though we quite exceed the rear yard setback, just the way the lot is configured, we ended up having to seek a very, very minor reduction in the rear yard area. 
all other setbacks are being met or exceeded um, on this particular lot, just speaking to the appropriateness of the size of the dwelling on the lot. It does conform to all those other setbacks that are required in the zoning that speak to scale uh, and density and that sort of thing. So we feel this proposal is um, in keeping with the character and with regards to the lot size, uh, the OMB also felt that it was in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. This is the site plan which identifies the two variances that we require and shows the dwelling on the lot. And if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, this is an overview of the variances in written form, just so that you know they're on record. Um, the reason why the lot area lost its, I guess, approved status is that a building permit was not submitted for any proposals on the lot within that three year transition clause after the 2008 comprehensive zoning bylaw came into place. And so it, it because of the wording of the transition clause, any variances that were not sort of enacted through a building permit lost their status, which is sort of a funny situation with this one because you can't undo this severance. So we're now faced with having to, I guess, get reapproval for an existing condition. Um, so that's sort of the history with regards to the lot area specifically. And if you go to the next slide, I am, I'm aware of the concerns with regards to trees um, and the situation on that front and, and, and the history of, of this, this, this neighborhood in this particular lot. So my client did um, have consultations with the neighbors. So here you can see which address, I don't have their names listed. Um, I just put the addresses, but these are the neighbors that were consulted and the approximate dates. I think we're fairly accurate in those dates. Um, but as you can see, it was all before the sign was posted on the site. So there was consultation um, to advise what was taking place, um, what, what the application was going to be, what the proposed dwelling was going to be. And so we feel there was sufficient information provided um, even prior to the notice going out or the sign being posted. Next slide, please. Sorry, it's taken a bit of a minute. <laughs> so I did provide some uh, information from the OMB ruling. Obviously, I won't read through it in its entirety given the time, um, but throughout the majority of the OMB decision, it was very clear that both the City of Ottawa and the board member uh, Denhe was very supportive of the variance to law area at the time recognizing that trees were a major issue for the appellant, um, which had appealed the, the C Committee of Adjustment decision at the time. They did request um, in condition four that uh, a tree conservation report be prepared by a qualified arborist, which has been done in this case. So we've met that condition um, and it's, it's following all city regulations for tree permits and identifies which trees um, are going to be removed with construction and notifies or and signifies that trees near neighbors properties have to be retained as per the city's regulations. So um, in this in this plan, you can see trees I, A, E and F are the ones that have to be removed. All others will be protected as per the city's required protection measures, um, protecting critical root zones and that sort of thing. And the owner has committed to planting, um, I believe five additional trees after construction. So they're gonna be planting more than what they will be removing um, for this particular project. So I wanted to relay that to the committee and also so that um, any community members would be aware. Uh, I can't recall if there's one more slide. Uh, so yeah, so that was it. Um, so essentially, the variances that we're seeking, the one is simply to uh, reapprove a previous approval for the reduced lot area and a very minor reduction in the rear yard area. And given the very minor nature of the rear yard area being requested and the fact that we're meeting 
or exceeding all other setbacks. We feel that the variances being sought are appropriate and do meet all tests of uh, all four tests in the Planning Act. All right, so Ms. McQuig, did I get you to uh, swear or affirm on the sign posting? No, you did not. I do affirm that the sign was posted by the date required. Um, I think for the record, I'm gonna go through this and we'll just, we'll just make it happen, okay? So, uh, do solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and that it was clearly visible and legible the entirety of the time. Do you swear or affirm that to be true? I affirm that to be true. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I um, totally forgot it. Um, okay, are there questions for Ms. McQuaig? No, actually, I, so I'm glad you, you ran through for a while there. I was trying to figure out how did they get the severance in the first place if the lot was undersized. And so I thought, that, I'm not sure how that happened. But um, it's interesting that there was the extinguishing of the, of the minor variance over a three year term tied to building permit. I don't know that I've ever heard that before. So um, might want to get some more, uh, some more information from staff someday on, on how that happens. But uh, as I always thought, once a minor variance, minor variance on a property and it doesn't extinguish. So I, I'm not sure I quite understand what happened there. Okay. So if there's no questions, I do have, um, let's see, who do I have? I have Mr. Lindbergh first, and then I have Mr. Boyd and uh, Ms. Potter. Don't actually have you, Ms. Fish, but we'll get to you uh, next in line after that. So Mr. Lindbergh, you, uh, you have the floor. I, I was intervening to postpone this. So um, I, I think I've said my bit other than to say, having seen a clear presentation of the Arborist report, it would have been very nice a, if that a similarly clear portion report had been really attached to the submission because the version I saw, even though I enlarged it as much as I could, was still illegible. And secondly, that's one of the things that would have been very, very useful to have the applicant share with the neighbors um, when they knew there were concerns about trees. So I'll stop there. All right, thank you. And Mr. Boyd, Ms. Potter, are you, uh, did you want to speak to the application? You spoke to the adjournment, but I just want to make sure. Yes, I mean, we do want to speak to the application, but we're talking to Kimberly, and I think uh, we'll turn over to Kimberly, then I'd just like to make a few comments after she speaks. Can we All right, thank you. Right, that's fine. And I, no, no, no worries at all. So Ms. Ms. Fish, uh, you're up. Thank you, sorry, I wasn't sure if I could unmute myself. Um, so to uh, brutalize the expression, this is my first time at the rodeo. Uh, had I known what I know after the last three and a half hours, I don't know how you do this on a weekly basis. Um, my first comments would be quite different um, three hours ago when uh, the owners first did do a, a door knock in whatever time frame that the agent posted. Um, my impression that this was a meet and greet and how do you do? Nice to meet you. Welcome to the neighborhood. I was not aware that this was an application or a notice of, of any type. So um, while those dates posted may be true, uh, they weren't, there was no awareness uh, on my part uh, that this would be uh, such a conversation that we'd be having right now. Um, I'm not here to contest the, the uh, severance of the lot. That was, uh, that was highly contested when it, when it was done. It actually still has a uh, better taste to to the neighbors. Um, so I said I'm not contesting that, um, but I do feel that there there is an attachment um, to that in that uh, that there is a, a concern with the massing of this house. Yes, pictures were shown that there are similar property or similar houses. Those properties are not the same. So we're not talking um, equivalent uh, equivalency here. Those, those pictures that you saw are on full size lots, not much significant, they're significantly smaller lots. Um, so that is not equivalent. I, I don't see how we can look at that comparison in that way. Um, this will take up huge space on there. We do have drainage, drainage issues at, at present. Um, my neighbors previously were original builders in the area. There was a drainage ditch running between all the properties that has been covered over. 
when you put that type of house, that size of house on that lot, we are going to have a huge drainage issues. There are already culverts that are blocked up and down our neighborhood that are causing significant drainage issues in the whole neighborhood. This is not going to help the situation in any way. Take away trees. Um, yes, they are going to plant new trees, but they, that's going to take 50 years to grow. Um, are there any guarantees by the builder, by the owners, by the agent that um, if you've ever seen a house being built, there, the property, the, the foundation, there are feet, mat, like meters around that base. How is, you know, a, a, a backhoe operator going to make sure that that root ball is not touched? What insurances, what penalties will the city impose should there be any damage to the trees that they said that they will not damage? Um, there's just, like I said, this is such an oversized house for the lot. Um, we, in our neighborhood, we have a characteriz characterization. We have, we have privacy. We've paid for that privacy. Um, my neighbors, all of us, we, that has been part of, we're all bound by those rules of building so that we can ensure that characteristic in the neighborhood. Um, when you have a house of this size, it, we take away that character that we have paid for. I know you've said the rules at the beginning, we're not talking about cost and everything like that, but we built, or when our house was built, it was built bound by those rules. And I do feel, as other speakers have said before, if there are rules for a reason, why do we not abide by these rules? This is, um, like I said, again, a significantly oversized house for this property, uh, for the development. We, again, are not, opposing development we're not opposing the separation of this but we would like it to be in character uh, to the neighborhood we would like there to be respect of the neighbors uh, again we had hope for an adjournment because we did not have time to study this with COVID we have not been able to meet properly with everyone to to really assess uh, to have that conversation with all the neighborhoods neighbors because I know that it would be more people here tonight and if there's this many people who have issue with this development, should that not be a consideration? So overall, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, uh, Chairperson, sorry, uh, again, for some of the rodeos, so I'm not too sure how to address you. I'm sorry. Um, we're asking right. that the committee can deny, deny the, minor, the uh, minor variance. Again, you consider it minor. We did talk about green space, how you like the preservation of green space. Looking at this, that the, the design, there's very little green space. The green space, green space will be born by my property, by my neighbor's property, if we want to ensure that that comes at our cost, not at the cost, the cost of the developers. Um, so we ask that this minor variance be denied. Give us opportunity to work with the developer and the owner to come up to provide more input into how the, the landscape changes, uh, because this really does change uh, our landscape in, in for me and for my neighbors. Um, Okay, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. I've had some time to make sure to try and get everything that I want to time, say. Take your um, time, yeah. Mrs. Fisher. I mean, you, yeah. you do, we do normally have a five minute rule, but take your time. <laughs> I do want to hear from you. You obviously yeah. took time to prepare, so. Yeah, so I think that's that's all I really wanted to add is that it's um, it really is not in care to the neighborhood, uh, despite what was presented before. And again, I'm not a professional. I'm not paid to be here. I don't, um, had I known that this is this was me the result that there were so many professionals who would be presenting consistently on behalf of the developers. Um, I'm a resident. I don't know this process very well. I'm doing um, so. I, I wish I had known. This is really not a a, a resident friendly process. Um, uh, it, it really doesn't really provide us the opportunity. Hence, why we were petitioning for that uh, adjournment so that we could have more uh, more time to prepare something a bit more professional that speaks. Um, specifically to what these professionals have been presenting. Um, we do we do that, that we are concerned about these thousand cuts, the, these smaller variances that seem so small, they really aren't in the, in the grand scheme of, of how, how the landscape is changing. Um, Alta Vista is a unique neighborhood uh, and that is one of the last spaces that there are space. Uh, I can't, I come from a very small town. We had an acre in the middle of the city um, I, I, that's why I, we saved our pennies and bought where we did is so that we could retain, I could keep that feel of a small, com a small community in a large city. And, uh, I do fear that this is being chipped away meter by meter. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Are there any questions for a speaker? Okay. So I guess Mr. Boyd, uh, Ms. Potter going to give you, uh, some, uh, 
an opportunity. Oh, Mr. Mr. White, did you have a question for Ms. Fish? Yeah, Madam Chair, just to follow up, uh, actually question directed to Ms. McQuaig. Um, the, as I understand it, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm correct here. The, the, the lot size, the lot area was essentially approved by the uh, Ontario Municipal Board back in, what was it, 2004 or 2008? Uh, so it previously approved lot area reduction. So we're really going through the same process now with respect to lot area with the, with the uh, we're, we're not, we're not departing from that original approval. The only minor variance then that we're really being asked to deal with is a two square meter reduction in the required rear yard area. Uh, I think I'm correct in that, Ms. McQuaig. Yes, that's correct. And I believe the, um, just going by percentages, I think it actually works out to a reduction of just over one square meter um, in the rear yard area. And we've noted that the, the rear yard setback is quite exceeded because of the shape of the lot. And also that southern side yard setback just because of the angle of the lot um, at its lowest point is something along the lines of 2.5 meters but then it, it, it goes to like four meters. So the side yard setback is greatly exceeded in comparison so, to the su plaza. Suffice to say then that in all other respects, except really with respect to the, the one square meter, two square meter reduction in rear yard area, uh, the house is, the, the proposed development is consistent with zoning bylaw requirements. That is correct. So, okay. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to just finish up with the public portion if we could then, uh, so Mr. Boyd. Ms. Potter. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, we're much in the same situation as uh, Ms. Fish was. I mean, this is our first rodeo as well. And I must say, it has been an eye-opening experience. Um, what passes for consultation, I'm appalled. Um, when uh, the advocate for the developer talks about consultation, I can tell you the consultation that occurred for us was somebody unannounced showed up on my doorstep during dinner, our family dinner, and showed me some slides on a laptop and left. Didn't give me a contact number, didn't give me an email address. I called the city. They said something would be posted. When it's posted, you have to call and get information. I had to call my, uh, my city representative uh, they gave us some information once the information came out. Uh, something was mailed to me on the 21st. Three or four days later, we got that. And since then, we've been scrambling to try to prepare some sort of response to this. Now, the people at the Community Association, have already noted, have been uh, amazing, helping us best they could. Um, we hoped, obviously, we're out on here. I mean, the developer has had six months a year, I don't know when he bought the property, to hire his uh, advocates, to prepare his arguments, to put together a lovely slideshow. Uh, we've had 10 days. And uh, here we are. Uh, in addition to that, I've been told by the, the committee that I don't actually understand the application, which may be the case. Uh, I don't to purport to have any knowledge of municipal law. Um, but here I am with our uh, application for an adjournment, so I could talk to council and could be properly represented, has been denied, so I'm forced to make or compelled to make submissions on something that uh, admittedly I've been told that I, I don't understand. And I guess I was apparently supposed to educate myself in the area of municipal law within 10 days, given COVID, the issues we have with, you know, making, getting our kids in school and maintaining our jobs and livelihoods during the COVID. But we have 10 days, uh, the developer has as much time as they want. That having been said, I'll do my best. First of all, I adopt uh, the submissions that Kimberly made. I think they cover a lot of the points. I would like to speak to a point that one of the committee members raised about the 204 application. Again, I don't have documents, I, I, but it's my understanding that the initial application was for an 1800 square foot house. And what is interesting is, uh, and Kimberly touched on this, is that the 
board has seen lots of pictures of houses, but those houses are on large lots. And the massing of this house is a concern and that reflects, and I would submit that ties in to the variance applications of both of them. And also ties into the area of the square footage of the backyards. What makes Alta Vista a special neighborhood? What makes it a, a, a great family neighborhood? And when we moved to Ottawa, we looked at a lot of other neighborhoods and those neighborhoods have been overbuilt. Those neighbors have, have been oh, in fields have come in. The size of the uh, backyard has been diminished. And bit by bit by bit, it chisels away at the character and the nature of the neighborhood. Now those pictures and those photos that my friend showed in her, in her presentation, uh, they are houses in the neighborhood on Marshall Court, but they're great houses. They're people who built with setbacks more than the level amount maintain the trees, maintain the greenery, and built within the, um, the cityscape of our neighborhood. That's not what we have here. Uh, it's interesting, the picture they show of the house failed to show our house and how our house will be overshadowed by the house that they're trying to put in. And it also did show the trees, which I found very telling because they know the trees will be gone. Uh, you know the trees will be gone. I mean, the idea that, you know, you're gonna build something two meters from a tree and that tree is gonna survive is laughable. I mean, if we're gonna have a conversation, let's at least have an honest and frank conversation. Right. So and Mr. Roy, I'm gonna, so we do, we do have a bit of a five minute rule. So I'm gonna give you another minute to wrap up your comments. Minute to wrap up, great. That's an even playing field here. Okay, now, what I would say is my greatest concern is I have not seen the Arborist report uh, that with respect to the the uh, tree on our neighborhood, our neighbor, and I have looked at the city. It does have a bylaw, a Protection of Tree Act, which discusses and talks about adjacent trees. We've received no information, nothing about that, and what steps are going to be done to to uh, uh, to accommodate that. I mean, the fact of the matter is this is preceded uh, with the residents being in the dark with the residents being uninformed. And on top of it, when we come and ask for a simple thing, a two week adjournment so we can inform ourselves, so we can prepare proper submissions, we're denied. And I find that appalling and very, very deeply disturbing. The first time I ever go to city council for anything, they say, no, you gotta get it all together in 10 days. And uh, I mean, it's like we had no idea that this would be populated by professionals. Um, but I guess you have to learn that that's the way the process works. But I must say, I am deeply disappointed by the process and the fact that it seems like ordinary citizens like us simply do not have a voice. And this has been tilted completely towards the developer. And I really would have been nice to have all the documents, to have seen the lovely sl slideshow they presented to you, to have seen the Arborist report, but we don't have any of those documents. We were provided with them. And here we are um, making submissions, I suppose, for the sake of making submissions to put it on the public record that we care about the trees and we're deeply concerned about our neighborhood and we're deeply concerned about overdevelopment in our neighborhood and the developers coming in and pushing through these types of developments which will ultimately destroy the character and the nature of Alta Vista. All right thank you Mr. Boyd. So what you did raise which I find really um, actually uh, something that the committee would like to address, and that is to ensure that, that uh, maybe the information that's on um, the city's website provide um, um, residents like yourself, maybe a better, a better idea of what it is that really does happen, uh, what the committee of adjustments, there used to be in fact, primer courses that, uh, can, and I'm, I'm thinking of you, Mr. Lindbergh, I'm, I'm sure you must have had the opportunity to have access to some of those um, those training sessions that the city used to, I don't know if they still do, but they certainly did used to offer some um, just sort of basic uh, planning background in terms of what the Planning Act provisions are and why they are the way they are. So, um, you know, I'm a big advocate of that. I uh, I think that more information to people empowers them. And uh, so your point's well taken that way, um, Mr. Boyd. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that I've uh, asked our secretary treasurer to, to be looking at over the, next, uh, over the next year or two is to look at exactly that. 
how we can help uh, the different stakeholders in the process. In particular, as you said, you know, you're not the professionals. The professionals already know what they do. They do it every day. But hopefully we can, we can find ways to improve the information that's available to uh, residents like yourself. So I'm just gonna, I wanna close it off. So is there anyone else in the audience that wants to speak either for or against this application? All right, so I guess um, members of the committee, we're at the point now where we need to, we do need to make, um, make a decision. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. If Fred. I could just um, jump in for just one second. I wanted to make a note of this in case it was missed at any point. It's on the uh, report from Lucy Ramirez. Yes, the thank you. description um, needed to be adjusted. Thank you. I, I Twice I had it in my mind and then uh, we got onto other things and I forgot it. I, I so, highlighted it just 10 minutes ago so I wouldn't forget. All right, so legal description. Uh, for the record, we need to amend the, um, the notice that went out to include, so we're not striking anything, we're just including uh, or adding to that, um, to that description, 4R-19848 parts one and two. I think that covers it, right? Okay, and you're in, you're, uh, obviously you're, you're in support of, uh, of that uh, modification to the notification, so uh, great. I trust the city, I assume it's correct. All right, so, great. Um, before we close off here, I just have a question for Mr. Lindbergh because um, I, I saw that you you represent the community association and and you know in in my mind in if uh, when there are applications like this can can you tell me a little bit, Mr. Lindbergh, about the process that the community association goes through? Do do you not track the the applications in your in your neighborhood and make sure that you're engaging? Um, residents when, when there are things. I guess I'm trying to figure out how, how some of this did get missed because typically that's the process. So I'm just trying to figure that out. I, I give you a, a short answer to that. Um, as volunteers, um, we're faced with a number of planning issues in the city at the moment, something called the official plan, the master transportation plan, uh, the realignment of ward boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. So, we don't have an unlimited amount of staff um, to track things. We do watch your agendas very carefully and we uh, review them every time to see what kind of planning issues there are. What we depend upon is local residents to uh, call our attention to their concerns un unless we see a major uh, planning concern. In the case of this lot, uh, much as we don't like it and we were part of the appeal to the OMB in 2003, um, as was pointed out, it, it has been severed. And so your minor variance one uh, is merely um, a procedural or process one. And your minor variance two is um, uh, relatively small and difficult as a minor variance to oppose. When the neighbors contacted us, we did have a Zoom meeting with them. And since then I've been tracking, trying to find out what the city planner is going to say. That report only became available Friday. So, and I was pushing to try to find these things. So um, an ordinary citizen would have no idea when to find the city planners uh, report on this. The forestry report came um, a couple days earlier and it had two lines in it. If you look at the submission that the applicant put in, uh, buried in a very large plan, which my computer won't enlarge enough to allow me to read, is what she presented in a, a much clearer format, their arborist report. And so uh, one of the hazards of going all electronic is uh, you people who are professionals can expand and subtract and, and see things. Uh, we can't do that. But that, that's a long answer to, to where we are, but we do follow all your things. You may have noticed earlier, we were contacted by the applicant for the Pleasant Park 
uh, situation, apl application. We had no comments for two reasons. One is it's a corner lot severance that's approved by infill two. And secondly, we had no um, intervention from any of the neighbors uh, expressing any concerns. Uh, but we'll be back when uh, when we see. And of course, if you remember, um, we, we had a, a, an intervention about a year ago, which turned down a corner lot severance um, in our neighborhood, not far away from Marshall Court. All right, thank you, Mr. Lindbergh. I appreciate that overview. Okay, uh, committee, I'll, I need to know who, all those in favor of the application for minor variants. All right, so. Um, Madam Chair, if I could uh, interject just um, one moment. Um, the site plan shows that the trees outside of the building footprint and the driveway location will be protected. Um, typically the committee doesn't tie um, lot area minor variances to plans filed. It might provide the community with a little bit more um, uh, comfort to know that, that in this case they are. So it's just something I wanted to mention. All right, thank you, Ms. Ramirez. So my, my only concern with that is that we're talking, we are talking about trees. So if you tie it to plans because you're trying to, to ensure that the trees are preserved, then my only concern is it's, that's not completely within the developer's control. They can try, but it's not completely within their control. So I, I, I'm gonna hope, to be honest with you, that we can, we can move forward with approving, and I think we did. So the, Ms. McQuaig, I think you saw, that uh, the application is granted. And for the record, I'm also in support of the application. But what I, what I really want is to get, um, make sure that there's, there's dialogue between, uh, between the neighbors and the developers so that, you know, so that they know what's happening and that they've got, you know, give them copies of the Arborist Report um, as they're undertaking the work and let them know in advance that it's, it's happening just so that, that there's no surprises. As, uh, as development of this lot proceeds uh, forward. So, um, but I do appreciate your comments and Ms. Ramirez, it's, it's not a bad suggestion. I was just a little bit, uh, just a little bit nervous about uh, the application in this case to vegetation, so. All right, well, thank you very much, Ms. McQuaig. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't, Chair, see, uh, don't see anything else we need to discuss. So uh, thank you and have, uh, Enjoy the rest of your 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 evening. I don't know that there's much left. <laughs> uh, I'm usually in bed by now, so <laughs> no, there's not much left. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, folks, we're on to number 15, 33, 45, and 30, 35, 55. Um, and it's Boris Boris Kate. I'm not even sure how to pronounce that street name. So, okay, I'm looking for the agent. Um, all right, Mr. Church, Ms. Carrera. Good evening. Good evening. Who is taking the lead on a presentation here this evening? Mr. Church? So, uh, Madam Chair, uh, my colleague Julie will be taking the lead on the presentation. Uh, however, I will be doing the affirmation for the signs. Ah, thank you. Thank you reminded. I knew I didn't forget this time, but thanks for saying that. <laughs> it's like, I, um, I do have to get to that. All right. So, Mr. Church, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted first at the property to which the application applies, secondly, for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and that the sign was clearly visible and legible for the entirety of that time. Do you swear or affirm that to be true? Yes, I affirm that to be true. Perfect. Okay. Um, it is 10.23. We're going to ask for a very short presentation. Okay, so we did, uh, we did submit us a presentation. I'm sure we'll pop up in a minute. And I just wanted to um, make sure there, we also have Mina Rasa and Kevin Murphy from Mad and Me. I don't see Kevin. I don't know if he's trying to get in or not. And Jennifer Ailey from David Schaefer Engineering um, is also online if any questions come up. All right. Thank you. So we can go to the next slide here.
It's actually pronounced Boris O'Shane, I believe. Boris O'Shane? Apparently, but I don't know. Maybe someone from Adam can confirm, but. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this used to be Cedar View Road. Yes. Oh, correct. is that right? Okay. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. So the property or the subject lands are located in Barhaven South. So we have Highway 416 to the west and Boris O'Shane, with the, which was formerly Cedar View. Um, to the south is Cambrian Road and to the east is the protected right of way fu future New Green Bank Road. And then along the northern edge of the subject lands is a future road called Flagstaff. All right, is it just me or did we lose? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay, so sorry. we did lose you for a minute there. That's okay. Sorry, it says my internet's unstable after being fine all evening. Um, so yeah, I was just saying Flagstaff Drive runs will run along the northern edge of the subject lands and it's partially been constructed, um, but not all of it, not all the way to Boris, so okay, Shane yet. Um, so if we go to the next slide. We're about to flip. Okay, so the lands are within Mattamy's Half Moon Bay West plan of subdivision. Uh, as you may know, Mattamy has a larger Half Moon Bay community uh, south of the Jock River, and this is sort of the final uh, subdivision. It was draft approved and zoned in 2018. And then in 2019, uh, there were some tweaks to some areas. So we did a draft plan amendment application, which is actually still outstanding. There's just a, one matter uh, left to resolve. Uh, but the zoning for the tweak has already gone through um, last year. So we go to the next slide. And that's Cambrian Woods to the immediate south of the subject lands, which is a city owned woodlot. Uh, so this is the concept plan for the subdivision, Half Moon Bay West. Uh, the lands we're talking about this evening are along the western edge. Uh, that gray parcel where it says lands to be severed is the parcel uh, that Madame is hoping to have severed off. And then the retained lands would be the remainder of the community. Although the, the remainder of the community is comprised of multiple different properties. Move to the next slide. Okay, so here we have the severed lands outlined in red, retained in green. Uh, so the severed lands would have frontage on Boris O'Shane and future Flagstaff to the north. The retained would also have frontage on Flagstaff and it also is an odd shape and it has frontage down on Cambrian Road to the south. Uh, so the purpose, actually you can just keep flipping through the slides, I'll just keep talking. Um, this, the block that's proposed to be severed um, is designated employment in the CDP, the Barhaven South CDP from 2006. And given that Madame is a residential developer, um, they're hoping to sever off the block so that it can be sold to a developer who would be able to fulfill the vision for this um, block, which is to provide either employment or retail, commercial or institutional uses uh, that would support the rest of the Barhaven South community. It's, this is the last phase um, of build out for the CD or one of the last phases for the build out of the CDP. So there's lots of residents in the area, not so many non-residential uses. So this would sort of allow uh, the sale of the property so that planning process could get started for that lot. Uh, so something could be developed there. So that's the pink there is the employment designation on the land use plan. You can keep going. Um, I mean, so the the block has already been zoned through that, um, the original zoning bylaw amendment. So it has a light industrial zoning with an exception that also allows uh, a place of worship. And the proposed lot area complies with the uh, minimum lot uh, area and there's no minimum required lot width. So there's no issues from a zoning perspective. And if you go to the next slide, um, one thing we do wanna talk about is servicing. Uh, so staff, 
in their report have expressed uh, concerns with respect to the timing of servicing. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, reiterate that um, when the CDP was prepared, a uh, master servicing study was prepared at the same time. And as this community has been developing over the last 10 plus years, it's been following this master servicing plan um, along. So the graphic you have up there, the developer to the north has already constructed uh, extended municipal services to about where we can see there's a 3387 Boris O'Kane Road, Glenview Homes. That's where the current, the pipes have been extended to recently. Uh, so they're about 250 meters uh, east of the proposed block to be severed. Um, so we do have this study in place that has been planning the servicing for this area for quite a while. There is an early, um, there is a landowner's agreement that allows for uh, any landowner who's in good standing to proceed with early servicing and front end any development. So it might not necessarily be Mattamy or Glenview extending services. It could be the future owner of that block. Um, so there's lots of options for who and when that uh, extension will occur. And Mattamy does expect uh, this portion of the subdivision to be um, registered and early servicing to begin sometime next year. Uh, but we just were concerned that condition two might uh, potentially hold up the sale of the lot. Um, so we were, we believe it's not necessary given um, how the services are developing in this area and how there's this uh, plan. Uh, so we were uh, asking if we could remove that condition if possible. I think that's it for now. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Just before we turn to questions, I just wanna make sure I get this housekeeping amendment. So again, with respect to the notice uh, and the zoning reference, we're striking DR and we're replacing it with IL special exception 304 uh, and also the EP1 and R3YY exception 1627 and the O1. Is, uh, is that correct, Ms. Carrera? That is correct. And uh, we also noticed that the draft plan amendment application, which has a different application number than the original draft plan application, isn't noticed on, isn't noted on the notice. So I'm not sure if that's something we need to add. It's referenced in the, uh, meant the revised staff report. Uh, no, I don't think we need to worry about it here. Okay. I think we're okay. I'm just waiting for, so just, I want to make sure then when I look at, hang on here. Okay. All right. No, the road reference. I just want to make sure we're not missing anything else, but no, I think we're okay. All right. Questions from the committee? Mr. Um, question for you. Has the Changed. Mr. Hindle, there's something going on with your uh, with your mic. My mic, that any better? Uh, now we can't hear you that well. So, but it was better than what we were hearing. Just so, just for the record. <laughs> so you know. Okay, it's better. It's it's fine now, okay. Mr. Hindle. There we go. Just unplug everything. We're good to go. Um, I was just curious, it looks like from some of the different plans you provided, is there an outfall or something behind the proposed severed parcel? It looks like the, the lot fabric has shifted. Ms. Carrera, we can't hear you, you're on mute. All right, I didn't mute myself. Um, there's a wildlife corridor to the immediate east that runs sort of north-south from Cambrian Woods, uh, north towards the Jock River. Is, is that what you're asking about? That sort of angled corridor? Yeah. Yeah, that was um, all dealt with and zoned through the previous applications. Okay, but that's reflected in the current draft plan of subdivision. Yes, so I'm just pulling up the reference plan. So yeah, the part one on the draft reference plan reflects um, everything that's west of that corridor. Okay. Um, and then could you just maybe reiterate your concern with um, condition number two? Is it in this case that you'd, you'd like to be able to, to basically sell it without works commencing? 
Uh, correct. So while we do expect services to be for early servicing to be issued at some point next year, we don't know the exact date right now. Um, and if Mattamy markets this property and, and somebody purchases it and they wanted to close a weeks or a couple months before we have the official issuance of early servicing, uh, they'd like to be able to do that. Um, and just given the planning that's occurred in this area and the landowner's agreement in place that allows anyone to complete that additional 250 meters, um, we, we personally didn't think it was uh, necessary to make it a condition in case there is sort of a matter of weeks or a matter of months that um, the sale wants to proceed. Okay, yeah, so maybe Ms. Ramirez, can you maybe confirm, but it's my understanding that this condition's in place specifically to um, ensure effectively that um, services are at least going to happen by the time that the, the severance is completed? Through you, Madam Chair, that is correct. Um, staff have concerns just given the distance of the services to the subject site. And our concerns are primarily that it's it's premature and not in the public interest if the services aren't being brought to the site in a timely manner, or for example, putting the onus of extending 250 meters worth of services um, on the future owner of that property. Um, during our discussions with the applicant and the owners, we discussed the possibility of adding a condition in alternatively to have the early servicing agreement um, entered into, which would effectively have the securities posted and the direction would be going to providing services to that parcel um, instead of having it unknown to when it would when it would occur. Um, so that is why we included that condition um, to make sure that the parcel is going to be serviced. We recognize there are plans ongoing and there have been, which to make sure servicing is, is going to the site and that ideally it's, it's done through the plan of subdivision application, um, which is ongoing and, and currently planned. Right. Now, in this case, if if the condition were to remain, but not be necessarily linked to commence of work, but be linked to posting of securities and execution of an early servicing agreement, would that kind of meet the intent of what you're hoping for? I'm sorry, three Madam Chair, could you re repeat the question? Just uh, just thing for clarification on what you would be looking to take out of that condition. Yeah, I think in this case, it's just looking at that first sentence talking about the commence work notification. Um, maybe it's just the nomenclature in this case, but I think I'm under the impression that assuming that securities are posted and early servicing agreement is executed, that we may not necessarily have, not have to have the, the commence work notification as part of that. My understanding is that they're all kind of interrelated and the commence work comes after this early servicing and posting securities. Um, I, I'm not well versed in, in the difference of, you know, if we were to remove that part of the condition and how that would affect it. I mean, ultimately, correct, it's the intent is here to have the services reviewed through the subdivision and the intent to being brought to the parcel. So uh, I think it would be possible. I don't fully know the impact of removing the commence work notification part of that condition um, that was drafted um, in consultation with the plan of subdivision planner. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'd be a little bit leery about playing with, you know, because it's so non-standard and, and uh, we don't see this very often, I think I'd be inclined to uh, stick with the wording proposed, to be honest with you. Oh, Ms. Sorry. Willis. Sorry. Ms. Willis, yes. I was wondering if um, it could be something that's either either through the plan of subdivision or through uh, the subdivision agreement or through an early servicing agreement. If it was either or, would that help at all with the would the applicant find that um, easier to live with? So actually, one thing um, kind of along those lines that we were thinking of if. Um, Another option, which we had kind of discussed with Cameron as well, um, was if we can't get early servicing by a certain date to fulfill that condition, could the condition be written that you get early servicing or 
Um, we've been, we, perhaps we could add a holding zone to that employment block that could only be lifted once the services are actually there so that the, con the consent could be fulfilled, the lot could be sold, but there's no risk for it being developed until that holding zone is lifted. And the condition, the, con the exception speaking to that holding zone would say at the time that uh, it's been demonstrated that there's adequate services provided to the lot. Could it be one or the other? And then hopefully we do meet early servicing in time. And if not, we'd be willing to submit a zoning bylaw amendment application to add a hold. All right, so the committee has no jurisdiction over the holding zones. So unless it's like, we're dealing with whatever's in place today. So it, it to me, it's, I, I don't see how that would work unless I've missed something. Like we, if, if it looks in a month's time that we're not going to get early servicing by the time Madme wants to close on this parcel, uh, then we'd submit a zoning bylaw amendment application to add a hold to the employment block. And that holding would prevent any development until the services are brought there. I'm not comfortable going in that direction, to be honest with you. We either decide we're dealing with something, given what we have, or... Okay. Um, Kevin or Mina, are you... I, I actually just, I wanna finish up with the questions from sure. the, uh, from the committee. If anybody else got uh, any other um, issues that they wanna raise or matters that they wanna raise. And I'm actually thinking um, group that um, we had talked about uh, condition number one, which, um, which uh, Mr. Hodgins, I guess I'm looking for some guidance from you because when we read this, there's actually nothing actionable from the committee standpoint. It's not a clearable condition. So I guess what we'd be looking for from you, uh, Mr. Hodgins, is is there a way to even to reword number one so so that we can come up with a clearable condition? And I guess some of, of the thoughts that we had was, um, you know, is it possible to, to maybe um, uh, add uh, the requirement for a letter of undertaking, for example, to ensure that some of, of what's happening here, because otherwise all we're really saying is that the owner acknowledges and agrees that they shall concur to a condition that's related to the plan of subdivision, but that's actually outside of sort of our purview at this point. So it's not, it isn't a clearable condition. So have you got some thoughts, uh, Mr. Hodgins on that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, thank you for the question. I did see that email from the Secretary Treasurer. Um, I, I think the idea with that is that uh, the ultimate clearing item would be that they prove. Um, apologies, I'm just reading it here. Is the concurrence on a draft plan of subdivision condition rather than just acknowledging and agrees? I think. I don't know, maybe the Secretary Treasurer could weigh in if taking that part out, the acknowledgement agrees, would that make it any better? Alternatively, possibly the um, an enter into an agreement saying that these lands are being, having their parkland vacation met through the plan of subdivision would be an alternative, which, which might be possible here. All right, Mr. Garnett, I think I am gonna call upon you to, uh, to uh, respond to that. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, uh, I think the only concern from an administrative point of view with the condition is uh, we understand that there is an acknowledgement and agreement required, but it's not specified what form that agreement takes. If it's an undertaking, uh, or as the chair alluded to, a formal agreement with the city or some other form that would be satisfactory to, to planning. Okay. I'm just wanting so, to bring in Madame's representatives so that they can speak to the proposed condition. All right, who are we hearing from then, Ms. Carrera? And we have Kevin Murphy. Murphy. I can see him there. And Mina Rock. We're having trouble with both. So, so what we really need to address, Mr. Murphy, is both the conditions number one and two. Right. So I don't think we're totally comfortable getting rid of number two at all. And we're not convinced that condition number one is even one that works for the committee. So I need your thoughts on that. I can speak to condition number one, and but Kevin, you wanna start with condition number two? 
you're muted. Sure. I mean, I mean, con condition number two, we, we are just hoping, uh, like, like Julie outlined, to be able to get this um, property conveyed so that we can get a tenant in there, someone to move that property forward uh, in conjunction with the rest of our plan. Um, we have done this uh, in the past in, in a similar fashion on, on the commercial properties that we own um, to, to, the, to the southeast of this um, at the uh, future Green Bank and um, Cambrian intersections where we were successful in, in then conveying the both commercial properties to commercial developers uh, in order for them to advance their site planning process. Um, in, in advance of servicing. Um, so we, we recognize that services are coming there within our next phase. Um, we just don't know the exact timing um, or, I mean, extending them out wouldn't necessarily be required until there was somebody uh, on the property itself because um, the, ser the services wouldn't feed anyone else other than that property itself. So we would like to have someone in there so that we can plan the appropriate services out that direction. Um, so. Uh, you know, placing a holding zone and, and having it conditional upon a holding zone would allow that to be completed. Um, you know, the holding. Uh, so certainly that would be a preference. Com commence work notice is maybe a bit easier, which is the discussion, uh, the, the condition that's listed before you right now, um, in that it doesn't require that, that uh, rezoning, um, but it, it does require, um, you know, that, that other engineering uh, advancement and, and like Julie said, if it's a matter of weeks or months, um, that, that, that could be a constraint upon the uh, sale of the land. So um, in, in some fashion, um, a, a constraint saying that servicing will be provided is, is okay with us. Um, the, the landowner's agreement certainly does speak to the fact that anyone that does own land can go in there and, and and service the land over top of the other owner's um, properties without, um, you know, with uh, without too much trouble. Uh, just the design and, and, a, and a simple consent from the landowner's group is, is really all that would be required. So um, we don't feel like there is really a hang up in getting those services out there. All right, thank you, Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm trying to, uh, I, uh, am I correctly understanding the city's concern that they're concerned that this development, uh, the conveyance and development of these lands might be uh, forced upon a, upon the city in the absence of having services? Because if that's the case, I mean, in reality, what are the, what are the odds of that ever happening? I can't see development pressures being applied to, to, uh, develop the, the, this parcel without services being extended. And it sounds to me that there are agreements in place with uh, the various property owners and, uh, and in I'm sure draft plan conditions that uh, will require the extension of services prior to any development. So I'm just not entirely clear as to why this condition number two is, is that critical. Through you, Madam Chair, as a result of the consent application, part one of the draft reference plan will effectively be removed from the plan of subdivision application. Um, in the city's perspective, it's, it's premature to have the severance go through if there aren't proposed services going to the parcel in a timely manner. Under the Planning Act, we consider if it's premature in the public interest and if there's adequacy of utilities and municipal services. I think part of the issue as well is are we going to put the onus on extending 250 meters with the services on a future purchaser of this parcel um, is, is part of our concern. Okay. I guess, it, I mean, if he wants to develop, uh, he's going to have to get services somehow. And uh, I mean, to me, the owner will, the, the purchaser will understand that uh, he's not going to be able to do anything unless he makes arrangements to have those services extended. But anyway, that's, that's my concern. All right, Ms. Wallace. A uh, question from Mr. Murphy. Um, with the landowner's agreement, um, I've been involved with the one in Kanata West for, for many years, or I was. Um, the front ending provision, that would then, um, depending on how the structure, when you sell the block of land that is the subject of this application, 
in order to service that land, depending on what the conditions are, those services could either by, be extended by Mattamy or they could be extended by a third party or they could be extended by the purchaser of the block and it's all covered in the landowner's agreement. Is, is that correct? Yep, absolutely. So it, I'm agreeing with Mr. White here. Does it matter to us who, who does it? it it's, it's like buyer beware with the purchaser of this block would have to sign the landowner's agreement unless Mattamy retains all those obligations. But in either case, the services have to go in before the land is developed. Um, yep. Okay, right. so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that it might be sort of a belt and suspenders to, to require condition two about the early servicing. It's gonna look after itself. All right, thank you. Mr. Hindle, do you have some thoughts on number two then? I mean, like I've, I've, I've worked with Mattamy before and I've worked in doing some land use agreements and some of those um, landowner agreements. So I'm, I'm comfortable with the, the language of some of those, at least the, the standard language in those things. Um, I think in this case, I'm fairly confident that construction isn't going to happen without services anyway. Um, so I'm not necessarily fussed one way or the other. I think I'm happy to keep it, but um, if, if the committee is unanimous or is comfortable with removing it, I'm, I'm fine with that as well. Okay. All right, on number one, folks. I've reread it a couple of times while I was listening <laughs> to the discussion. I just thought I'd give some context here. So this block currently is part of Mattamy's Half Moon Bay West subdivision. Through the whole subdivision process, parkland dedication has been calculated and parks have been planned. Um, so when the staff report, the first version came out, it spoke to Cash and Lou and I simply pointed out, well, we've already, Mattamy's already accounted for the parkland that would be generated from that employment block. Therefore, I just said, should that condition be tweaked to, you know, say, you know, if Mattamy's already provide, if they've already done the calculation for the number of units and the area of the non-residential land and dedicated um, and zoned all those parks already, should it not, should the condition not reflect that as well? So then this is the new condition. Um, so I think, I think the original condition was just sort of the standard, you will, sh you shall pay cash in lieu, but then I just acknowledge that they've already planned for that in the subdivision. Ms. Carrera, I guess where I was going. <laughs> I'm actually wondering whether or not we need condition number one. At all. <laughs> I thought you were questioning. Okay. Nope. <laughs> That's not where I was going with that. So I? because I, it seems to me that there are, there are still ways to pick, pick up the cash and loot. So I, I'm not even sure unless we're asking that it come through us. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I understand this one. Mr. Hodgins, I will give you a chance to explain them. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Madam came, Chair. Through you, so. Uh... Again, um, given that as part of this consent application, these lanes will be removed from the subdivision. Um, in theory, it would be possible, in theory, to make an argument that the parkland dedication rate now does not need to be meet that uh, which was previously calculated given that a chunk of the lands have been removed. That is the general concern of um, the department. Um, the condition was uh, agreed that the cash new park land it is being accounted for in the existing subdivision, but there is a revision application ongoing and future changes can be proposed. So this was just to ensure that um, going forward, the lands were to be included in the parkland calculation for the larger subdivision and that the city wasn't losing out either on cash and lieu or parkland amount uh, as a result of this consent. This, is this really the right place to be doing that? So I guess part of what I'm thinking at this point is, is there not another, is there not a vehicle or another way to do this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna hear from Ms. Willis if that's all right, please. Just um, a suggestion would be if there is a concurrent uh, draft plan application, subdivision application, the means of clearing, I assume, could be that the, the applicant provide evidence that the requirement for cash in lieu on this block be included as a draft condition in the 
um, in, in the overall application so that we can, the committee could see that it is a can over and above the normal uh, requirement once the block comes out that it's acknowledged and agreed that the um, cash in will apply at the time of draft uh, at the time of registration actually so it'll have to get cleared through the draft approval process so Ms. Willis then I guess the, I'm just wondering about the timing for something like that that would mean that there would literally need to be the um, sort of the approval of the plan of subdivision before the time frame of the um, of the uh, severance is uh, is through. Well, see, Mr. Murphy has been wanting to speak for a while. So, <laughs> all right, Mr. Murphy. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to talk over someone. Um, I I will just add in a comment on that parkland uh, item. The there is a master area park land agreement uh, as well for the ownership group. And so part of being in good standing with the ownership group is making sure that the uh, correct amount of parkland has either been dedicated somewhere else within the uh, community design plan or that you have posted it within your own property. So um, that parkland condition really does get settled out uh, within the group itself um, as, a, as a backstop. <laughs> So Mr. Murphy, that owner's group then is specifically owners tied to the community development plan. Yes, uh, well, all, all the owners within the uh, catchment area of the Barhaven South landowners group. All right, so, and everyone's a party to that? Yeah. If we sever off this lot, is it possible that a new player comes in not subject to that agreement? No, they would still be subject because they're parcels within the catchment area um, sure. would okay. have to be a member in good standing. So can we then, you know, then what I'm thinking is why don't we have a condition as number one, that they provide, they, they provide evidence that there is that agreement in place and the cash and loo will be covered. Why don't we do that? All right. So, and Mr. Hodgins, are you okay with making a that kind of amendment where we would ask them to demonstrate that there's this agreement in place that will meet the requirements for cash and loo? Um, through you, Madam Chair, it's difficult to stay on the floor without fully consulting with the subdivision planner. Um, I think in, in theory, it does make sense. I am just not sure the impacts on draft plan of subdivision that's ongoing as a result of this change. All I'm thinking is right now that condition isn't uh, a clearable condition. So I would far rather try and work with something that we can follow up on. So, all right, let's, let's, uh, let's do that then. Let's change the wording of the condition to read that um, the owner will provide evidence of a an owner's group uh, agreement with regards to the cat. And I'm really, it's late, so not worth smithing this as well as I wish I could be, to be honest with you. But I think we get where we're going here in terms of the condition. You're gonna prove that you've got this agreement in place. You're gonna prove that the property will get the cash and loo that's required and that it's all sufficiently covered. That's what we want evidence of to clear that condition. We're good for number one. Okay. Number two, I guess we need to make a decision here as to whether or not we're sticking with number two at all. Or, and I think I heard from Colin and from, uh, from Kathleen that they, they could see it go. And uh, Scott, you're, you're not um, fussy one way or the other. And I've got to say, I'd be more comfortable keeping it only because, um, only because I think there is an interest here to the municipality that, uh, that needs to be protected. So where do we go? What's the downside of keeping it? What's the downside of keeping it? Could we hear I, I actually want to hear from the committee members. <laughs> so, so Kathleen, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, I was just gonna ask exactly that for complete clarity from Madam E, what the downside is to them. If this, what, what problem it causes them if it stays in. All right, thank you. The, the, only, the, the problem is timing. Um, we'd, we'd like to facilitate this um, severance in the agreement. 
um, shortly. Uh, we are starting our detailed design for that area uh, in the next coming months, but that could take um, you know about six months to go through. So, so it, it would be the problem would be the closing of a sale. It wouldn't prevent a purchaser from getting in and starting their site plan process in the meantime. No, it's a no. It would be the closing of the sale. And you don't have a you don't the marketability have a, of the of the marketability of the property really. You have a purchaser right now. Uh, we've we've had lots of interest. Uh, I wouldn't say we have anything um, signed up yet right now. No. Very we are starting to get interest, White. which which is why we're taking it uh, forward. All right. So, Mr. White, do you want to? Yes, um, Madam Chair, I just reiterate my my uh, previous points that uh, I don't really see that development is going to proceed on this without adequate servicing being available. And I'd also see a potential economic development uh, benefit to the municipality. Uh, I know there's a lot of interest now in, in uh, commercial development, uh, commercial and industrial development in South Nepean and, uh, you know, um, I, I'd hate to see any restriction on that. Uh, it's not necessary uh, to ensure that development proceeds on a, an appropriate basis. So, um, I, I just don't see the the critical need for that uh, condition number two, as I said, development isn't going to happen unless it's properly serviced. All right. Okay. I think um, I'm I'm prepared to let it go as well. If uh, if uh, Mr. Wright and Ms. Willis uh, are uh, are leaning that way, um, and to be honest with you. I'm I'm going that way because I'm I, I kind of hear your arguments about about servicing. At the same time, I'd be interested to see what happens with us through in the fullness of time, right? So this is one of these things where where um, maybe even an, an item for a committee of the whole at some point to better understand the mechanics of all this stuff so that we know if we're removing this what the impact truly is. Um, all right, so okay, I think that's what we're at. Um, I believe, have I called, have I asked at this point whether or not there are any members of the public who wants to speak either for or against this application? I don't think I had, but okay. So there's nobody left from what I can tell. All right. Um, so committee, I'm looking for uh, your, um, your vote uh, as amended. So amending number one and removing number two of the conditions. So all in favor of that? All right, okay. So Ms. Carrera, Mr. Murphy, the application is granted unanimously uh, on the basis of the amendments that we just uh, we just talked about. Thank you very I much. Think, I think that's about it. It's 11.02, folks. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a long day tomorrow. <laughs> Um, okay, so I need a motion to adjourn. Ms. Willis, seconded by Mr. Hindle. <laughs> Mr. Hindle was first. So thank you very much. We are done for the evening, and uh, we'll see everyone again in about two weeks. <laughs>